It's time for Twig this week in Google. Paris Martineau is here. Yay. Jeff Jarvis is here. Woohoo. Aunt Pruitt has the week off. Aw, but he'll be back next week. Lots to talk about. I had a dream, a way to make the world safe from AI. We'll talk about that. Sergey Brin has a dream to bring back Zeppelins. And Google has an idea that maybe the .ing domain will be hot. All that and a lot more coming up next on Twig. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Twig. This week in Google, episode 740, recorded Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. Michelangelo's Nunchucks. This week in Google is brought to you by Miro, the online workspace for innovation where your team can dream, design, and build the future together from any location. Tap into a way to map processes, visualize content, run retrospectives, and keep all your documents and data in one place. Get your first three boards for free at Miro.com slash podcast. And by Collide. Collide is a device trust solution for companies with Okta. And they ensure if a device isn't secure and trusted, it can't log into your cloud apps. Visit collide.com slash twig to book an on-demand demo today. It's time for Twig. This week in Google, the show we covered everything but Google. Paris Martineau's here. Hello, Paris. What's up? What's up? From the information.com. There's her signal number if you've got a hot tip for her. Uh, and there's your rubber plant, or is that a, a what? It, what kind of is that a pothos? It's a monstera. A and monstera, it is yes. Larger than me, it is taking over my home. It's taking over my life. You didn't think when you bought the plant that's named Monster that it might? <laughs> well, I didn't think about it because for many years I lived in apartments with poor light, and it stayed about the size of like two to three cats. And I moved to this apartment, put it in my bathroom which gets great light and humidity and it is more than six feet tall i have five baby versions of this plant all over my apartment oh it's ruining it splits it all. off oh yeah. that's cool it's, i mean it splits off because i'm cutting it because it's yeah. getting too large to that's keep actually cut. exciting at some point you might be engulfed by a monster i mean at some point you might say oh Paris Martin on, and it'll just be a plant here, which could be really fun for you listeners. I, I believe that uh, that was uh, a Men in Black uh, comic episode at one point. Um, anyway, hi, Paris. Good to see you. Hi, Leo. Jeff Jarvis is also here. You may you know, know him. Luck. What did you say? Did you say the F word when I said your name? Oh. No, oh, I said, speaking of men in black. <laughs> oh, okay. All I heard was that. <laughs> we never curse on this show. You know? never, be, never be taught us not to. It was last never. Week, sure never. Did. He's the Leonard Tao Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University. I have to be very Newark. careful of my pipes, Leo. What's the matter? I'm, I'm two-thirds of the way through doing my book. Hmm. You know, I saw the picture of you uh, and the screen and your producer getting down. How how many hours in this in this in the little little cell have you spent? Uh, they they scheduled it for four full days, ten to five. I've done two so far. We're two thirds of the way through the book. So if we really do a good job, and if I don't f up again and again and again and again, as is my want, tomorrow we might be able to do it in, in that three days. When I did a very short piece uh, for uh, Audible, my biggest problem was rushing. Speaking too yes. quickly. Oh, me, Lord knows me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, and I just, you know, the, the, the guy's job, he's one, Tony's wonderful. Of course, he has to watch every single word I say. Oh, no, you left out the the. Right. Go back. Do you have to get it exact? You wrote it. You can't get it. You can't, you have to get it exactly he right. Wants, I think it's his, it's his honor kind of. So yeah, I, I, exact. How exact. interesting. Yeah. Wow. If I may plug, well, I'm plugging. Also, tomorrow is pub day. <gasps> How exciting. Or magazine object lessons magazine it's a little book it's a little little wee book and i tell the story of the launch of entertainment weekly in here i tell stories of Condé Nast, where both paris and i have worked uh oh, i talk boy. about the um the life and roles of the magazine it's a fun little book this is tomorrow. a big opportunity uh for you paris because jeff can hardly speak and aunt pruitt's not here so 
Yeah, wow. if you're on. <laughs> it's your show. It's my it's my time to take over the show. Jeff, do I have permission to show this picture? It's from Facebook, and I feel like I didn't. I, what is the? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I feel like I always show an Instagram picture. Oh yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. but I I don't know about that Facebook. was also on Instagram. Oh, it I was think. okay. No, yeah. no, I don't know. Yeah, I put, I put it all kind of everywhere, yeah. But I looked on Instagram the, and I did not see it, so I, I ran no, yeah, to Facebook. Yeah, Facebook's fine. It's all I think public. it was on a story, perhaps. Or something. Oh, it was a story that might I've be seen it somehow. I yeah. don't have you on Facebook. Oh, we have to fix that. Are you on um, Facebook? I don't have any. No, no, I use Facebook for Marketplace and joining weird groups as it relates to my reporting. Only. Yeah. Basically, buy, that's why oh, I'm Facebook. back on Facebook is to see what's going on with disinformation during this war and uh, the uh, election to come. Are you seeing much disinformation? No, but for some reason, I, Facebook has gotten so much worse. For some reason, I mentioned this before, I almost hesitate to say this, but without me giving them any input, I'm seeing a lot of scantily clad women on my Facebook page. Um, that is I, definitely just a demographic choice by Facebook. Yeah, they're they're pushing these towards me. These aren't people I know, um, I, but for some reason they're pushing these uh, girly pictures my way. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to. Beautiful women in the USA. Yeah, I never. Photo. Yeah, now I know that I can. <laughs> geez, I know that I can. Um, uh, Snooze, beautiful women. But it's in for the thirty USA days. No, hide, hide it. Hide all beautiful. Hide women. it. Hide all beautiful women. <laughs> Don't want to see any. Wow, don't pick that. <laughs> but but I ask you, Mark Zuckerberg, why did you decide to... And I mean, I'm not kidding. It's not just that account. There are hundreds of them <laughs> all over my Facebook. Well, you know I'm, what happened to me, Leo? I so accidentally got switched. That, Go ahead, Paris. I was saying it's so funny that it says you will not see any photos <laughs> from all beautiful women in the USA yeah. in your feed anymore. <laughs> These are all recommended posts of, of women in their underwear. And I did not ask for this. Is Leo, it, I have a I have an old a personal a fan page kind of when I did the first book, and I got switched and I haven't used it in years and years and years. I got switched to it somehow on the phone, and it was all junk and none of my people and nothing at all. And then when I switched back to me, it was okay again. All Are I can you, say it's is really hard to switch. To I'm not. Sure I'm on you? my personal page. It's got the pictures of me and my wife. It says oh. I'm married. Maybe because of my age? I don't know why. It's definitely your demographic and that you're a man on Facebook. Yeah. This is just what they it's show horrible. men on your age. On, well, it works for a lot of them. So It's a thirst trap, and I'm not happy about yeah. it. I don't like it. I'll, anyway. say, I'll open up my Facebook feed and scroll. And my What do you get? Do you get men in their underwear? Post. What do you get? No, I get like I've gotten... <laughs> John tickets to a John Oliver show. See that I would uh, like the Atlantic. Yeah, um, that's good. A bunch of posts. Oh, about you're classy. Century Unlike you, Leo. Furniture. See, She's they understand classy. you. They understand you, Paris, and they think they understand me. Maybe they do. Maybe that's really what I want. Carnegie Hall. That's more highbrow than I can even. Wow. Holy cow. Thanks, Facebook. It's because you live in Brooklyn. It's true. I think I'm getting. Why. Route 80 rant commute with Johnny's French fries and hot dogs. <laughs> so the, this you, is appropriate. The, you're getting junk food. Me. I'm I'm yeah. getting I'm women getting in bikinis. Crate and barrel couch. <laughs> I'm getting a crate and barrel couch that's all white, which I think is really a aspirational. No, it's really ambitious but, of Facebook to recommend. Here's the weird thing. I have two crate and barrel couches in my house. They're not white. They're leather. Wow. They're brown. But uh, still, I'm the one who sh <laughs> I should be getting that. Facebook, you don't know me like you think you know me. Um, Did you say you had a dream, Leo? I, oh, okay, the so the big story. Yeah, it's going to. Uh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> the big story uh, this week is the this on Monday, the president issued an executive order that basically says, you know, we ought to be safe when it comes to AI. So, I mean, I can't really disagree and he has some proposals for uh, what that means interestingly uh, at the same time as he did that this is the executive order on the safe secure and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence or eos to doof ai um it doesn't uh, <laughs> Policy and principles. The policy of my administration to advance and govern the development and use of AI in accordance with eight guiding 
principles and priorities. Artificial intelligence must be safe and secure. Okay. Okay. So All should right. uh, no. No. Cool. no. So should stair oh, trends. Yeah. Promoting responsible innovation, competition, and collaboration will allow the United States to lead in AI and unlock the technology's potential to solve some of society's most difficult challenges. The responsible development and use of AI requires a commitment to supporting American workers. This is just BS. They're just taking normal governmental uh, boilerplate and, and adding the word AI to it. Artificial intelligent policies must be consistent with my administration's dedication to advancing equity and civil rights. Okay, there's some there's something to be said there because we know AI can be a little but, but biased. What exactly? How do you do that? I'm not Especially reading the when, lengthy. When it spits back all of our biases and all of our prejudice in society back to you. Um, don't well, you fix that first? There is stuff. I mean, I'm not reading the full. I'm just reading the bullets. It is a very long paragraph. Yeah. My administration cannot and will not tolerate the use of AI to disadvantage those who are already too often denied equal opportunity and, and justice. From housing to health care, we've seen what happens when AI use deepens discrimination and bias. Um, the, good, the thing I will say, and it goes on and on and on, the thing I'll say about this is it focuses on the proximate dangers of AI, not, uh, yeah, not the BS. extinction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, there's also the EU is right now going through this. Actually, Ben Thompson has a great piece uh, in Stratechery. Um, he calls it attenuating innovation. That's, he, that's what he says AI stands for. And it actually, it's a little trip down memory lane because he starts with Bill Gates blaming the Department of Justice on why we didn't, they didn't dominate in phone. It, completely wrong. Uh, and then talking about how Steve Jobs really got it right by saying, we don't know what a new technology will do. You just have to put it out and the people will tell you. In any event, uh, Ben talks about what's going on in the EU right now. Um, we are by the way, well, EU or UK, because the UK has the meeting. There's the UK, Bletchley, right? oh. yeah, the Bletchley Park thing, but it's got, it's got, we're, Euro Europeans are there as well as it's not just the UK. In fact, we're oh, there. Well, yeah, yeah, the vice president's there. Yeah. Um, so this Bletchley Park thing is more focusing on, you know, the risks of extinction. Uh, where, where Musk, just, just, I got to answer. Musk is, there. Musk is there. He meets with the prime minister. Musk was on, um, Rishi Sunak. Joe Rogan. Yep. Uh, saying that, uh, what he fears is that environmentalists will use AI to exterminate humanity to protect the earth. This is, you're, you're inviting this guy to tea? Why? He's an well, idiot. and then Rishi Sunak came out with a statement, which basically... That is the plot of the video game Horizon. <laughs> Horizon. Really? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> kind of, yeah. That's where the end game gets it to. Spoilers for Horizon, but I guess... <laughs> I think Elon Musk had a dream, actually. I guess yeah. he had a dream, and it uh, is a licensed media property. So my... Uh, Anyway, the the uh, the uh, the Bletchley Park uh, declaration is more about existential harms. The uh, e EO from the president in the U.S. is more about proximate harms. I finally figured it out last night in a dream. The problem is not AI. The problem is people. Yes. And 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 really, uh, <laughs> you know, every major technological innovation has been co-opted by humans for a weapons system. Uh, or sometimes it's the other way around. We got computers because the Defense Department made computer, computers so they could uh, aim bombs more accurately in World War II. But it, f the main motivation of humanity is how can we kill each other better? And uh, so if there's a risk of extinction from AI, it's not from AI, it's that it will be a weapons system. Uh, when when you, know, you think about the atomic bomb, uh, physicists came up with uh, some really important discoveries in quantum mechanics and relativity that led us to believe that you could convert matter to massive amounts of energy. Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, the, that the amount of energy you could get out of a gram of matter was equal to that gram times the speed of light squared, a huge number. And, and somebody then said, you know, that'd make a great bomb. And we had the Manhattan Project. And I think that's the real risk from AI is that 
in fact, it's probably already happening, and not just in the U.S., but I'm sure in China. They're looking at ways to use AI to control the populace. They're looking at ways to use AI to fight wars. And that's the existential threat, not... But they, they've used... They've used fire for that. They've used every the technological press for that, except they've for the used zipper. Everything for every, that. except for the zipper. Every technological innovation has been used. Just you wait. Just you wait. The zipper's <laughs> days kill, are coming, Leah. To kill more people. Isn't that and, the point of 2001: Space Odyssey? Uh, my, my zipper is AI controlled. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Add an AI to that zipper, and then you've got a mass extinction. There you go. Oh. A 2001: Space Odyssey. That's basically what that's about, right? Well, now, now, Benito Gonzalez, who is our esteemed producer and uh, technical director, uh, what is the plot of 2001? Like in the beginning. Hey, uh, who can monkey, tell? The when monkeys the monkey are going, the, to throw, the they're going around with their That's bones. That's the first tool. They used it as a weapon. The and first they, tool they, as a weapon. They figure out you can use a bone to kill other monkeys, right? Um, and, and that was thanks it up to and the, it turns it into the, 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 star, the Star Wars, whatever, the Star right. Wars thing. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Whoa, whoa, you know, whoa, I've never whoa. had, okay, so you ha Benito, I've never had that movie explained to me <laughs> as succinctly as you just did. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, there was, a, there was a monolith placed on the Earth, and then there was another monolith out on Jupiter. And once we get to a certain technological level, we'll discover the monolith in Jupiter and then, and then the movie becomes completely It's all over. <laughs> yeah. But then the zippers come in and who's to say yeah. where we go from there? No, but am I not Brian, wrong that the real so threat of AI is it's just another technology like atomic, like, like fission. But. Yeah. But. But where do we go from there? What, I mean, what, what the I think problem if is you end humans. up in the same sort of issue that you ha were in when we came to the atomic bomb or any of these other weapons, which is it's a race to the finish line. If you're not using it for war, another right. country or power or entity will. Not that that means using it for war is a necessarily good thing, but we're probably going to be in an arms race. I don't know what that would look like in the case of AI, because I don't think it's as easily translatable to active harm as, you know, a bomb or dare I say a zipper. What a number of but, people but, have said, including Jan LaCoon from Facebook, Ben Thompson in the Stratechery article, is that Sam Altman and other movers and shakers in big AI are really just saying this as a form, and I've said this for a while, as a, as a form of regulatory capture. Please stop yes. all development of AI so that we can we can win. Uh, and so we, I think I re I've rejected that. We've rejected that before. That's that's not the threat of AI, and we shouldn't stop AI development. Mm. But I don't think these Bleshley Park declarations or the uh, executive order from the president really are quite on the nose. I think what we really need is a Geneva Convention, almost. Well, no, we need see, agreement you know, among among the major powers not to use AI militarily. Okay. Okay. Two, but two how things. would we be using AI militarily? Yeah. Oh, that's what. Well, okay, so here's, to me, this is the scenario that I dreamt of last night. <laughs> Have you seen RoboCop? So the first the first step is <laughs> Minority Report style use of Leo AI. Leo works all around the clock. He, he never... <laughs> he so the always first, making... He, I did watch he, Minority he Report the other night. He out and clocks in. Yeah. <laughs> the brain is always working. Um, so the first use will be from law enforcement trying to predict crime, pre-crime. Uh, try, and we're already doing that. Uh, there's an AI tool that finds gunshots, except it's horrifically wrong, right? Uh, mm -hmm. that many, 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 and also the facial recognition tool facial recognition. used to find people who have committed crimes, which is also often horrifically wrong. So that's that's the initial use and, and only slightly harmful. But it's but you see the already the in, in the inclination is well, how can we use this tool? First, to control people, I could see China is already, I'm sure, looking at ways to use social credit and other things with AI to control their population. And then it's just a short step from there to autonomous fighting machines. Leo, can I, can I try to calm you down for a second? Yes, all that can be true. Could, could, could. Things could be done with these tools. But the danger of the, your way of thinking there, it will control the tool that everything is okay. Well, no. No, I didn't say control the tool. You didn't listen. Well, uh, I, 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 just, we have to be careful not to cut off at the same time I agree. the good uses that come. 
And let's remember back. And I just, I'm, I'm in my next book out next year, basic books, title changed. I don't know what it is now. Um, goes through this and and the, the panic about radio was exactly yeah, similar. Professor, oh my God. Professor. It's got to be used by bad people in bad Let's, ways. Now, in fact, it was. It was used by Goebbels, but it was yeah. also used by FDR. Yeah. So I'm not proposing that we stop the technology, and, and that's exactly what's wrong with these Bletchley Park and EO. Right, right. Uh, is that they're saying, well, let's halt everything and figure out some rules and stuff. I don't even think there should be regulation. That's what Ben Thompson's saying, that AI doesn't stand for artificial intelligence. It stands for, uh, what did he say? Um, oh, I forgot already. It was oh, the headline already, of it. Yeah. Attenuating innovation. That's why I'm saying we need more something more like a Geneva Accord. We need an agreement, like between, chemical, like a chemical warfare thing. Yeah, we need a that, that you don't agreement use between those company, countries. Biological warfare. That, yes, that we will, and we maybe need to say, and it will not be used for law enforcement or coercive. But uh, what is and isn't AI in that in that context? So, so that's a great you, question, right? What do you you not use laptops? Do you not use Google Search? Do you are you not, not using use uh, an Translate? algorithm on right. the Right. Well, on your Facebook feed? we've talked a lot about AI versus algorithms. Um, maybe we shouldn't be using computers for war either. But my but well, the risk of extent of that uh, bomb is out of the, the out of the silo. The existential risk is that you lose the, to lose control of the AI. Right, that's what everybody's talking about. And you and it's not an issue to lose control of Chat GPT. <laughs> it happens every time I use it. It's an issue to lose control of a arms system. Uh, it's an issue to lose control of uh, an enforcement system of RoboCop. So I think we make rules about not AI, but how humans can use AI or or what kind of agency you give AI. We need a, a Geneva Accord between governments. Now, that's not going to stop. Just as 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 you know, unfortunately, terrorists can have access to atomic bombs now. It's not going to stop uh, humans from doing what we do so well which is misuse the technology. But at mm -hmm. least if government's going to get involved, at least governments should step forward and say, we commit to not using these tools in weapons systems, uh, in coercive uh, policing systems and that kind of thing, in face recognition. I think, I think that the issue with AI is that it is not as simple as any of these tools that we have uh, come before. AI is more like an accelerant for a vast uh, array of things. But what an accelerant. Think about, I mean, think about an atomic, an think about, to, think about atomic fission. Yeah. We had bombs before then. And the, all they were thinking is, well, it'll be a bigger bomb. Oh no, it's an even bigger <laughs> bomb. And that's the thing is <laughs> AI will do bomb. that to both, you know, policing yes terrible facial My recognition exactly. stuff as well as uh you know leo's silly pins a bunch of probably good things that i'm not thinking of right now because no, and, i'm in and, and fission mode. fission uh, is but also is nuclear what power plants. is going to you know fission's not all bad that's what yeah i know but i mean that's what makes the solution difficult here well but you, i'm just saying like, what would a geneva convention on ai look like here because you in order to regulate something that is crossed all industries in this way is going to be really difficult. I don't think that it's impossible, but it's going to be incredibly difficult. And it's going to be the sort of conversation that I don't think we as a nation, much less like us as a global community, have had before a conversation that is that nuanced and predictive, because right now this is all in a very early stage as well. Well, and that's also uh, Ben Thompson's point is that it's it, it would be restrictive on innovation. But yes. instead of using radio, let's use atomic uh, fission as as an example, because that's really a much more dramatic uh, uh, tool. Um, if before we invented the atom bomb, would would it have been prudent for us to think about whether we should? Certainly, but also yeah. I think it would have been prudent but it also wouldn't have mattered because the reason why we ended up in an arms race over the atomic bomb is because the Nazis were on the other side of it. Well, that's time. why Oppenheimer and, did it, right? He was Jewish. Yeah. And he knew that the Nazis, he was told the Nazis are working on it. They're probably closer. He knew the scientists and he knew, yeah, they, they could beat us. And that would be the end of the world if the, atom, if the Nazis got uh, atomic bombs. So we have to develop them. Do you think we're in that situation? 
We better develop AI uh, weaponry before the other guy does? I think I now mean, is I a good time for ask. us to say let's not. Now would be a perfect time because you're right. The minute we're in a war, <laughs> it's too late. We're going to well, again define define what's forbidden. So write the statute. Write the write the statement. So I have to think more about it, but I think in general no, the idea is not to it. give AIs agency in the physical world uh, or to very much restrict the kind of agency. Look, they're not a threat to us. But you want you want human responsibility. Yes, because the Still problem the isn't the technology yeah. ever. Yeah. It's what humans do with it. And we want we'll the technology to do, to do the good stuff. So what we could probably do is think about, well, what what limits on the use of AI would we like to... Or, or let me and try this. at least how, say how for robots? weapons systems, at least... Right, so how about robots? I think that's even, even closer to AI than fission. Fission's so big. You so and the controversy we're already in is that robots make cleaning even ki killing even cleaner, easier. We're gonna love it. Uh, Soldiers aren't at risk. You get a Boston right, Dynamics dog. Right. You give it right. AI. It can tell the difference between. Let's say, hey, we figured out how to tell teach Spot how to tell the difference between a Hamas agent and a Palestinian civilian. Have at it. Do we want to allow that? Doesn't that seem a little risky? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't think, but I mean, I think. Do you think the Israeli government, if given that opportunity, would try to pursue that? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Do you think they might already I mean, I, be I trying agree. to pursue that? Yes. I agree with you wholeheartedly that I, there certainly should be people out there saying, yeah, let's have a human in this and not just have an autonomous um, entity, a machine of some sort making these decisions. But I also think we are probably a ways away from that a ways away from i the fear sort of that we are not that, that far away fear because all you have to do is add face recognition to a spot the atomic okay i will say yeah to play devil's advocate a little bit what is scarier someone builds something that they're calling autonomously intelligent or someone right now is cobbling together a series of systems to make decisions in a way that they want and hiding behind the responsibility of it being autonomously intelligent. But it's really just, well, you precisely. know. precisely. Plus, we have, an, as, as Stochastic's parents pointed out, we have kind of an, an, an inherent trust of these systems. Oh, they're going to be objective and non-biased in a way a human never could be. And so we should trust them if, if, you know, we put this robot out there that's figuring out who the bad guys are, and who the good guys are. Um, I think now is a good time to go to governments and say, let's all agree not to do this. But here's the thing, Leo. It's just like privacy legislation. It's just like Internet safety legislation. It's all this stuff. It's government saying to companies and individuals, it's trying to control them, not themselves. There's no discussion here of controlling Government and government no, is a big no, threat but no, to no, privacy. That's why I'm saying it's a Gene companies. it's Geneva Accords. I know, but, but but those are between but, governments. I don't see it happening. Well, if I you don't, don't see it happening, happening we're in deep trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we're I gonna mean, get worse. I don't governments. see it happening, but I'm also a pessimist. I think it would be great if something like that happened, and it yeah. was I'm not, negotiated I'm just in saying, good let's, faith. We had our the best experts in the world working on this. Certainly, it'd yeah. be awesome. That's what. But so I'm just unlikely. saying, let's redirect all this attention on oh, safe AI. What does that mean? Regulatory capture, blah blah blah. No, no, the people are the problem. We need to go to government to government, get the governments together, have a big summit. And you're and not say, just saying the people are the problem. You're saying the, in this case, it's the governments are the potential. Well, ones. obviously. Be specific. It is people because just well, as yes, with nuclear but, weapons, you're going to have a suitcase bomb. It's not civilians. Bomb. It's not corporations. Ultimately, it may be. But right now, the the most proximate danger is from government. So let's do that. Now, we couldn't do it with, uh, you know, cyber uh, terrorism. But so uh, you're right. I mean, look, I'm not saying this is, this is going to happen. I'm just saying I would prefer to advocate for this. And I did have this epiphany last night that there is an existential threat from AI. And it, but it's not the AI. It's how humans use it. And, no, and I don't think Always. it's hard to think of a way that mm -hmm. humans could use this, weaponize this in such a way that it would be a real problem. Right? Absolutely. So, I think especially given what you just said, that people put a lot of faith in these technologies, yeah. whether or not 
Oh yeah, they it's actually much better than humans. Do the things that uh, they're right. supposed to do. Yeah, I understand. Well, there's a cheery the, opening the, to the show. Well, we're I'm doomed, saying, everybody. No, no, no. You're the one who said we're doomed. I'm the one who said let's get together, guys, and figure it out. Let's go to the Chinese and the Russians uh, and the Indians and the and the Koreans and let's and let's say, you know, this is perhaps a risk we should all be worried about. The reason we don't we we can agree not to use chemical weapons and uh, yeah, admittedly. Um, there are governments using chemical weapons. Uh, Bashar uses chemical weapons against the... Yeah, I, I think what you're talking about is not... Let's, let's, let's cast it a different way here slightly. That no autonomous weapons systems, that even a drone is controlled by a human who ultimately is responsible. Oh, a, a robot no. is... I think you're looking for autonomous. No? What was that? Uh, this is um, a, a U.S. Oh, phalanx CIWS no. aiming at a passenger oh. airplane. This is an autonomous gun aiming at a passenger airplane. Just no. Yeah, and the sailor who's uh, not in control of this is not oh, too. Oh man. Is thinking it's funny. I love that he sound it sounds like when your cat jumps on the wrong table. You <laughs> yeah. know. Oh He's got no. A very cavalier there approach. There we go. Hey, those there robots with oh, guns. No. Um, we we can, the governments have gotten together and agreed. Let's not use chemical weapons after World War One. So you don't want. I think what you because want because it was a hazard AI to everybody, and you don't want to open Pandora's autonomous. box. So you I don't think, want autonomous systems. AI AI becomes a then you have to define the AI, whether it's a robot or a drone or a computer program doing something. Here's the issue: every decision An AI made by human that beings. doesn't have agency in the world is harmless. The minute it's given agency. If the minute it can do something in the world, Autonomy whether it's too. unplug right. yes. unplug the socket or or bomb a civilian population, it's a it's a risk because we don't because we think AIs are reliable and trustworthy, and they're not any more reliable and trustworthy on these things than humans are. But we're going to give them power to make these decisions. We need to have a bright red line that governments all agree to that yeah we we got to watch out we can't give them agency. Because as well, soon as they can do, act no matter upon what the they world, do, there's a risk. Yeah, they're they're going to do. They do this today. They do scenario planning, right? They are going to write scenarios. The computers have done it for years, but it has to be a human being who makes the decision in the end. The same problem with facial recognition. The sin isn't. In the, I've been saying on the show for eight, ages. It's not in the facial recognition. It's if if you believe it and act on it in an unjust way. And we, by the way, we're capable of this. We did that with atomic weapons. For a while, there was the thinking that the best way to have mutually assured destruction was to have automatic, remember Dr. Strangelove? Oh, yeah. Automatic oh, yeah. systems mm -hmm. uh, so that there you wouldn't have to, that the Russians would have absolute assurance that if you attacked us, our automated systems are going to bomb the hell out of you and and that that would protect us. And we we I think we learned pretty quickly no, there needs to be a human. There need to be two humans with keys on opposite ends of the room because you can't trust these systems. The right, problem right. is we are now in this bubble where we think AI, oh, that's the solution. AI could do this reliably, uh, uh, you know, with without any mistakes. Well, so so, some think that sane people do not. I do think it is worth trying to have the conversation early, at least in this case. I it's, mean, it's now or never. It, it can't hurt <laughs> because, because just as with Oppenheimer, once there's a threat that, let's say, the Chinese are about to do this, then every responsible scientist in the United States will say, "Well, we got to do it." You know, we don't want to fight a chi an autonomous. You know, we don't want the Clone Wars. We don't want to fight an autonomous Chinese army. So we, you know, I, I. I, I never worry about a Chinese invasion of the United States, right? No country would be stupid enough to physically invade the U.S. It's too geographically spread out, and we have way too many guns. So no country <laughs> would do that, right? Except, you know, hey, if you were going to do if you were going to do it, maybe if you did it with robots. No, still, you'd have to have a hell of a lot of them, and you you'd have, have to, to stop have a lot making of iPhones. For a lot of I years. Think, to I think the Chinese already are thinking about using these kinds of systems for population control, coercion. Uh, and I think that they could easily. I'm sure that our government and other well, we governments yeah. are too. Yeah, we might I'm be. sure that uh, yeah. most large powers are. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So so here's a New York Times. But that also assumes a third person effect is that when you go back to them and do it again, go back to print, go back to radio. 
the presumption is, oh my God, people are sheeple and we can control them easily. And I think we have to give people as a species a little more credit than that. Now, some people, you could say, well, how do we get the extremists in this country? Because that's, that's it's, it's playing to something deeper and darker in there. It's not about a message that controls them. Here's That's a, what we have to worry Here's a story more. thanks to our Discord from the New York Times. AI comes to the U.S. Air Force. The Air Force gave the New York Times a behind-the-scenes look at its effort to build a new generation of autonomous combat planes that rely on artificial intelligence. No pilot in the air or on the ground. I see the uh, no on the ground issue is not good. Wow. So that this, is this would the be base near where I grew up. Yeah. That's wild. So I'm, I'm just thinking... <laughs> Instead of, you know, everybody getting together and saying, you know, we really ought to slow down uh, open AI uh, or we, you know, uh, or You're Elon Musk right. saying we need a, a AI that uh, likes humans. We should maybe be thinking a little bit more about the militarization of AI uh, yeah. and, and maybe make some rules about uh, that to me is the real threat. Well, those rules will have to come up emergent from civil society. They're not going to come from government. Government's not going to say, oh, let's control ourselves, even though there is a bill already in Congress to not allow AI to launch a nuclear weapon. Fine, thank you very much. Um, but it's got to come from civil society. It's got right. to come, and is it the UN? Is it the World Economic and, Forum? And this, is, this is where Margaret Mitchell and Timnit Gebru are right with stochastic parrots, yes. because there is this, you know, sense that, well, somehow, because the computer's doing it, it's going to be more reliable, more robust, uh, more fair, more just. No, no. Right. They're completely right. All right. I, that was my dream. I have a dream. Okay. Some of us did have you go nice back dreams. to sleep. Wow. I did it's go a back little, to sleep. Uh, a little darker than well, I've been the arguing. Last time someone was talking about I have a dream. <laughs> yes. I've been arguing for months now that, oh, existential, schmexistential. Uh, but what I forgot is humans. <laughs> and you know, you know what prompted all this? Uh, two things. One, of course, what's going on in Gaza right now. Uh, and, and it, you know, between the 2,000 Hamas terrorists who murdered innocent children and partygoers and then the, uh, move, the, the, the knee-jerk res military response from Israel to go into Gaza and do the same, it really became clear to me that as humans, we're a murderous, bloodthirsty species. And then I was watching mm -hmm. Band of Brothers, which is about World War II and, and uh, how they marched into the camps and how appalled they were by it. Uh, and then I started watching a documentary uh, that was made by Alfred Hitchcock and others, film shot at the end of the war uh, directly in these camps. And it reminded me how awful we are. <laughs> As, as a species and how readily you know, I think you got to watch some different things before no you we are it. no look there's plenty of wonderful things there's also Michelangelo there's wonderful things but humans uh Michelangelo a, did weapon systems too yeah we're a bloodthirsty lot and um I feel like every technology that we come up with the very first thing is well can I kill somebody with this and I think that's what's going to happen with AI and that's what really worries me his signature weapons were a single and dual nunchaka. Who are you talking about? Michelangelo. Bruce Lee? Michelangelo. Well, that's, that's the, sorry. That's Wait a minute. Cartoon. Michelangelo? You're talking about the Teenage that is Mutant the, Ninja that Turtle. That is the Teenage Mutant Ninja. Yeah, that is the turtle. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> um, Michelangelo. No, Michelangelo. I, wasn't, I wasn't talking about him. <laughs> um, shoot. You can this, see, this is the problem now with search. A large rat. Michelangelo's I nunchucks. Michelangelo. I real Michelangelo. <laughs> He's not here. Uh, can somebody get on Mid Journey and uh, get us a uh, a thumbnail with Michelangelo's nunchucks in it? Because yeah. I think we have a show title. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, let's take a break. That's Look, good. that's depressing. It's really depressing. But I'm. I just feel like um, I. I what I realized is that there's a really good direction to regulate AI, and that's it. Uh, and that's something we really need to. Uh, but you're regulating government. You are not regulating AI, and I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. But A, if you regulate AI, you're regulating human beings in the end. In this case, the human beings you're regulating are military and government. And so it's not regulating AI at all. Whether it's... I, right. It's regulating the use yeah. of AI. Just in the same way as if you and said, other we will not use nuclear f fission to make bombs. Uh, that would, be, would have been a nice thing. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Missed the boat on that one. 
Uh, but let's not give the bombs to the AI, okay? That's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> seems seems on I the, think it's obvious. I think it's a good idea. I, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just too cynical. I also I feel like it is unlikely that it would come to pass in terms of government regulating itself. And two, of if course. that somehow did happen, I think it would be even more unlikely that it would be effective. And three, if it was somehow effective, I think it would be even more unlikely that some government wouldn't just say, ah, not for us and do it Good anyway. Right. And the, only, the, same the only thing that gives me hope terrible is, situation. is that we have Geneva Conventions. We have a United Nations. They are imperfect. They're not 100%. And yes, weapons of mass destruction and chemical weapons are still used to this day. But but there's but there, we've done something to to slow them down a little bit, and I feel like mm -hmm. at least something like that, a convention, and maybe that you know, look, I'm as cynical as the next guy. I mean, I, I agree with you. It seems unlikely, <laughs> but you know, I th I think AI at this point. And now here's the next question. Well, I was going to take a break, but I have one more question: Is AI progressing at a rate sufficient to be a threat in the next ten to twenty years? If you today, you can ask AI how to make a bioweapon or how to make a new bomb or how to make a whatever, and it could well come up with an answer that may be um, practicable. I don't know. Could you use it to that way? Yeah. You Only could a human could. Yeah. But let's, yeah. By the way, Leonardo da Vinci did invent. Da Vinci. Weapons. It's da Vinci. It's da Vinci. <laughs> it's an idiot. I looked for the wrong. What what did you type? <laughs> oh, you typed. I typed Michelangelo. I should have typed Da Vinci. And so what I got was the, yeah. the weapons. I got the mutant ninja turtles. I love it. Uh, here from Mad Hatter and our IRC, catastrophic AI harms among warnings and declaration. This is the Bleckley, Bletchley Declaration. Twenty eight nations. The first day but of they're the, trying to blame technology for it. Right. Technology is the least of it. It's bad humans. actors. It's humans. Bad governments. It's humans. That's the whole point of my next book. Maybe we it's should just regulate us. humans out of the whole picture. Could be good. It does kind of make sense that the humans would say, oh, no, it's not us. <laughs> it's the AI. <laughs> uh, well, Anthropic the, is the there. DeepMind is there. IBM, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, OpenAI, yeah. and Tencent. They're all there. Elon That's, is there. China is there Kamala Harris is there um they're all there this is this is where you could have those accords unfortunately you know they're no, not with that bunch um uh, no Elon Musk I mean at the summit said quote for the first time <laughs> we have a situation where there's something that's going to be far smarter than the smartest human it's not clear to me we can actually control such a thing he thinks he's the smartest human, which is that, that equation, by the way. But this is exactly the wrong thinking. This is the thinking that we can't yes, control it. Yes, yes, it's yes. it's its own thing, and uh, it's it maybe this is our last chance as humans to say, "Oh yeah, wait a minute, we we're the ones, we're in charge." But well, how, then you how got then on sixty that, minutes has to have on someone other than Jeffrey Hinton. They have to have on Timnit Gebru. Well, I'm hoping that, that maybe Hinton. What I was thinking is maybe Hinton had already gone through this thought process of mine. Benito, no, you it, wanted to say it, something. It part of that. My oh. question is, how, how oh. effective do you think like a, a, an international accord would be? I mean, we have like the Paris Accords and stuff like that, but that hasn't done anything for the environment, you know? No, but uh, you're right. I mean, look, uh, it's the only tool we got. We also had uh, SALT talks, remember, the strategic arms limitation talks under Reagan that actually did kind of make the world a safer place. We have the Geneva Accords that prevent the use of biological, chemical, uh, weapons, torture, uh, they're it's not perfect. norm setting. It's norm setting. It's norm it tries setting. to set a line. It's the for international the purposes of accountability. Exactly. Uh, the international it's not community gonna, saying, there's no physical way it's going to stop it. Right. But you can point to it and say, "Are you doing that really? You, we said we shouldn't." It's all we got. Yeah. I mean, what else are you going to do? It's all we got. Until the aliens come and spank us. <sighs> that might be our last best hope. Maybe just you know. It's I mean, true. you're, you're going to laugh at this, but it's actually the kind of thing that the World Economic Forum raises. What? Really? <laughs> yeah, it is, because they bring the government people together, and they sit them down, and they and because they want to be in the mountains, and they want to eat the nice hors d'oeuvres and the nice uh, cheese, um, they'll sit through 
these kinds of discussions. Oh, not the alien part, part, the other part. Public discourse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when has the World Economic Forum really produced anything valuable I'm, I'm, I'm to society? I'm not arguing at all, Paris. I agree. But what, what, what Leo's saying, I think, is that we need this in public discourse. I think so. And we need to really say that is, this is where the danger lies. I think that it would lies. be notable and helpful if we had a large government body throughout the world pushing these sort of reforms, or at least bringing this to people's attention on a regular cadence. That can't be understated. And the, uh, the only thing I really wanted to say is I had the epiphany. It's not the AI. It's the people. The humans. <laughs> It's the humans, and well, and and we we need to stop blaming AI and start saying it's not what it's not the AI. It's what we do with it, and humans stop it's the it. Same, it's the same for the internet. That's what I argue in the next book. It is the same for the is internet. That we have it to is. stop thinking yes. that the internet is. We have to start seeing it for what it is, which is a network of humans. Yeah. Period. It's yeah. not a technology. This is true of, of, of so many technologies. It'd be like still covering, you know, why do journalists cover the internet as technology? They should be covering it as politics and culture. Taylor Lorenz is one of the few who really, you know, does that in the popular press. Um, and, and, and Paris has people, Paris convinced her organization to do feature stories, to, to start to look at this as a, as a question of human interest rather than technological interest. That's what we need to be doing that's the context in which we need to understand all this technology. And, and the same thing happened with radio and TV and so on. It was seen first, the first pa moral panics about TV were, what's the screen doing to your eyes and your brain? It was about the technology, not about the content. Um, but at some point, the technology receded into the background, and we realized that it's what we were making with it that mattered. And that's what this discussion needs to be. And forgive me if I, it's self-aggrandizing, but I do There's think... There's the siren coming to get you, Leo. I, I do think that we, uh, in, in in the tech media right now, at least we're talking to people, especially young people, who will be developing technolo these technologies in years to come. So I think it's somewhat incumbent on us to say, hey, don't don't forget. It's not the... The technology is not the issue. It's the people. And it's how the this people is, use it. Don't forget that. This and, is also... if I may get You need to be responsible is, when you get... To yes. the point where you're starting to implement this stuff and you're Robert Oppenheimer, you, you need to remember that part. So this is it comes down to the humanities. And what I what I wanted to do at the school I'm leaving, and what I hope to do at another school is to start a degree in internet studies, which is about just that, to bring in the humanities, anthropology, history, ethics, design into this discussion more than technology. <laughs> and then there's That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, look, it's hard. It's right. easy to be hopeless, but despair is the biggest enemy. So let's let's you gotta get do what we sleep, can. Leo. You got to get a it was sleep. dream. I went. You I went back you to sleep. Worrying about the world. I didn't Jeez, get worried man. about the world. Actually, it, it was uh, just was. A, Did you write it down or you remembered it? I remembered it. I was wow, on my that's impressive. Yeah. Uh, and meanwhile, Yuval Noral Harari, who I like, I like his books. I read his books. Yeah. Says AI is an alien threat that could wipe us out, but instead of coming from outer space, it's coming from California. You see this crap? <laughs> All this crap. Mm. It's coming from California. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break. Uh, so fun to have Paris Martineau from the information here. There's something going I'm on. I'm a little less depressed than when we started the good. beginning of this conversation. I think the Monstera <laughs> is reflecting <laughs> upon you in a good fashion. Wow. Thank yeah. you. We're just trying to keep it at bay. We're going to not upset it. And that's me, really Paris. important to me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Jarvis from well, uh, Paris has QME. the alien right there in her apartment. It's going to it's coming use her computer from and take over the world. The house. That's it. That's, <laughs> that's it. the original artificial intelligence is this big plant. Yes. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by, by the way, Ann has the week off. He'll be back next week. Our show today brought to you by HID Global. Reduce risks, operating costs, and complexity. How? By outsourcing public key infrastructure operations to HID Global's cloud-based PKI as a service model. It provides automated management of the complete certificate lifecycle and encryption. It's your one-stop shop for simplifying private and public key PKI management with one predictable price on one easy-to-use platform their simple subscription plan has no additional charges for additional certificates under your current plan. It's geographically dispersed. 
It's scalable architecture across multiple regions. HID Global goes wherever AWS is. Ease your procurement pains with HID Global. You get up and running in two weeks. You get That's much quicker than the competitors. You get their assistance with deployment. It always includes their incomparable white glove service, their expertise, their knowledge. This is what they do. This is their this is their thing. Plus, you'll receive ownership of private keys. For Google and Mac Systems, HID connector model of PKI uses open source certificate utilities. So your organization can use multiple operating systems, which is great for BYOD. Look, all you got to do is visit hid.link slash twig. See how it works. See what it can do for you. HID.link slash twig we thank them so much for their support of this week in google you support us too when you go to that address hid.link slash twig uh let's see let's go google uh has come up with an interesting idea okay i can't Ooh. decide whether to do the earbuds or the blimp we'll start <laughs> <laughs> This is good technology. <laughs> this, this is, is sweet technology. technology I think we should all technology. go back to blimps, generally. I, I think that's well, really smart. I agree, and so does Sergey uh, Brin. He got FAA approval for his initial flights of his airship, the Pathfinder 1. This is actually a 40% a scaled-down model of the actual Pathfinder. To reassure you, it is a helium-filled blimp, not hydrogen the pathfinder one is 124 meters long they'll be they you if you are live in our area if you live in silicon valley you'll be able to see it just drive around in mountain view because he's using a, a one of the old airship hangars in moffett field you know those giant hangars if you ever drive down 101 you see them uh and he's rented it and that's where they have constructed the uh, pathfinder one uh, the FAA says you can fly it within the boundaries of Moffett Field and neighboring Palo Alto's airport spaces oh. at a height of up to 1,500 feet, which means basically they That's can go low. out. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, they don't want to, to get in the way of uh, traffic, air traffic. Right, right. Uh, but it can go out to San Francisco Bay. It just won't because there's an airport there right there what in San Jose. What does one use a blimp for then? Well, just to hang out? I'm glad you asked. Cargo. There have been a lot of businesses. There was one big one that started in Germany, try cargo lift, that was trying to imagine the blimp is able to move very large cargo pieces. Yes. At a very but is that what cost. Sergey Brin is using it yes. for? Well, cargo? The in gondola the for the airship that they're using can accommodate 14 people. So it's not exactly a passenger vessel. But as I said, it's smaller than the original. I mean, the, the, the one there, the Pathfinder 3, which is 180 meters Long, but eventually, here's what uh, the story in the IEEE Spectrum magazine says. Ultimately, LTA, that's the name of the company, intends its aircraft to be used for humanitarian missions, deploying cargo and personnel to areas that are inaccessible by road. Britain funds a separate nonprofit called Global Support and Development that's already carried out such missions by sea in the Caribbean, Latin America, and South Pacific. Britain formed GSD after using his own yacht to ferry medical personnel to the scene of a cyclone in South Pacific. Get on the yacht, boys. We're going to the cyclone. The nonprofit has since used other vessels in partnership with the Yacht Aid Global. <laughs> Yachts to the Yag. rescue <laughs> to respond to hurricanes and other disasters. Hey, if you've got a yacht, you might as well use it. GSD also recently well, that's launched... That's how we got the Brits out of Europe. Yachts? Oh, yeah, Dunkirk. Yes. You're talking about Dunkirk. Right, Dunkirk. They weren't yeah. exactly yachts. They were more like little fishing vessels. But okay. Fishing boats, but... GSD right. also launched a purpose-built vessel capable of transporting dozens of medical staff in full-size shipping containers. The MV motor vessel Dawn carries its own watercraft and vehicles. <laughs> this is what happens when you have an infinite amount of money. Money, yeah. Uh, you read a lot of sci-fi. You got some free time. Yeah. But in a way, you know, where else is this crazy innovation going to come from? Uh, the crazy innovation of blimps. Blimps. I think this is a great idea. People hadn't been thinking of those clearly before Sergey Brin. Well, okay. His money's going to a great well, use. The humanity. I know. Oh, well, the humanity. I know. You know, and of course, immediately on Reddit, everybody's talking about the Hindenburg. I, this isn't the Hindenburg. I'm sorry, are you coming to the defense boys? of blimps? Yes. Leo? I am. I am on <laughs> yeah. the side of blimps for good. 
BFG. I I wrote on the Goodyear blimp. Did you? It's quite noisy. I the list. Yes, it is. Uh, my uh, my great uncle uh, worked on the Goodyear blimp. Oh, that's fun. I've always what wanted to What does one go. do on the Goodyear blimp? He was a mechanic. On it. He you just fly around. Mechanic. It's more It's more like yeah, a big, around. It's a big well, billboard. It's advertising. It's yeah. a billboard now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's also a, a sports camera. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean- as a, a in its role as a, as a advertisement for Goodyear, yeah. yes, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a lot bigger than that. This is an airship. Um, there is sci-fi. It, was it Neil Gaiman? No, uh, it was Neil Stevenson. Uh, in in uh, his book uh, Terminal Shock, had a uh, had the the millionaires rode around on blimps. Yes, it was slower, but it was much more luxurious. That's how they and it was by the way, eco friendly. Yeah, I was going to say, that's uh, also Kim Stanley Robinson who wrote um, Ministry of the Future. Yeah. Like, in the future, it's all going to be blimps. Ministry of the Future. Have you read that? I have, yes. I'm a little, I don't want, I'm hesitant because it's about how we will deal with climate change. And it's, I felt like it might be a little depressing. It's, it's kind of dark. Yeah. In the beginning. At okay. Least. At the beginning. But eventually, blimps. Yeah, it's basically the solution so it'll for also, Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting is it'll have, it'll, it'll be able to do, to do VTOL. Vertical blimp takeoff and landing. slow up That's and right. down. This right. can go up straight up and down, which is a big deal. 120 kilometers per hour max speed. Yeah, it's not uh, It's not a jet, but that's not slow. It's yeah. faster than you could drive. Take you two days to get across the country. It'd be a nice two days. But it'd be a it'd nice be two nice. days. I'd take the train if I could. Termination shock. Thank yeah. You. That's the name of the book. Wouldn't it be nice to take the train? It would be lovely to just yeah. do a cross country. I mean, you can kind of piece parts of it together, but Amtrak and when the I US was a kid in sad. 1971, we when we moved to California, we we flew to uh, Chicago, but then took the train from Chicago to Oakland, and it was wonderful. We had a how long does that sleeper. take? It was about two and a half days, three days. Yeah. It stops yeah. a lot. We had a dog, our dog with us, so we would we would stop in Wyoming and you'd get out and you'd walk the dog, you get to, you know, look around and get back on the train. It was really, it was a wonderful trip. I'll never forget it. My uh, mother was frightened of flying. So when we went to Disneyland the first time, we took the train out. Nice. And on the way back, she said, screw it, we're flying. It is, it is uh, lengthy. Yeah. 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 For the longest time, my, I had the, the dream of taking the Trans-Siberian Railway yes. all the way across, but obviously that's not going to happen anymore, nah. or at least not in the foreseeable future, but it seems so fantastic. You know, there is a similar ride uh, across Canada that I have been dying to do that's supposed to be wonderful. I want to do that too. Yeah. Leo, on Leo, Vaya. I've got it. Should we do Screw our shows this. from it? Yes. Instead of this cruise crap. Yeah, Let's I'll, I'll come on a train. The twit train. Woot, woot. Choo, choo. <laughs> this yeah, is... Uh, <laughs> Leo's this... going to have a little a little conductor's hat on. I like mm-hmm. this. You can attach the microphones to your train car. Yeah. Very cute. Canadian train vacations. You can ride via Via. Uh, all, and look at this. It's beautiful. That's we could beautiful. do the show right there. Oh, yeah. that's yep. true. Yeah, t- Leo, I'm telling you. And in the background, you hear chuka 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 chuka. I took a uh, train across um, Norway this Ooh, last year. I've it done was that. Phenomenal. I've done that through Bergen, right? To oh, Oslo. Yeah. Yeah. From Oslo to Bergen, it yeah. was the most beautiful train ride I've ever been on. How yeah. long did it take, Paris? It's a day. I don't know, like half a day. Yeah. It, wasn't it was like that eight long. hours. But you go through the land of Hoth. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know that? Huh. that? So after you leave Bergen, you're going through. It, we were there in yeah, the yeah. winter. It's very snowy. And uh, that's where they shot. Which which episode? I can't remember. Empire. Empire Strikes Back. The land of Hoth is a snowy land. Oh. And they shot that there. So you go through it. Pretty exciting. Ooh. I didn't see any ak ak yeah. ak but... Uh, I really want to go back in the winter. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. My wife was less than happy with it. <laughs> Pretty cold. <laughs> she, uh, we were going from Christiansund, which is all on the West Coast, uh, back to Oslo so we could come home. We were there for a photographic uh, um, 
kind of event. And we were invited to speak and so forth. And we went, thanks to Mick Olin, my good friend, uh, with Catherine Hall, the photographer. And uh, we were on the East Coast. So we uh, took the Hurtigruten from <laughs> Christiansen to Bergen. The Hurtigruten is it's not exactly a cruise ship. It's uh, It goes in all the fjords. It's a boat. It is a boat. And it goes and it's, but it, uh, we were, it's overnight. You have a little cabin. So we took the Hurtigruten, which I'd always wanted to go on. Uh, did you see the Northern Lights? Did not. It was uh, not that time of year. But uh, unfortunately, uh, Lisa was got very sick. <laughs> Didn't enjoy it. Oh, no. And then. See, you wouldn't do that on a train. Well, but then we got off the Hurtigruten in Bergen and got on the train to Oslo. And it's another eight hours, and she she was just miserable <laughs> the whole time. It took us it took us two days to get from Christensen to to uh, Oslo, and she said we could have flown. We'd have been there for two days. We could have gone to some parties, but no, you had to go on the Hurtigruten and the railroad. <laughs> Lisa, oh, well. Lisa, I want to hear, but the Canadian railroad. I is she's beautiful. she's open to that. Nice. She's open to she's that. Open to that. Yeah. I'm telling you, the first has any other podcast been done from the rails? I'm I'm all in. Uh, we're gonna have to get a lot more members in Club Twit. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like right <laughs> now. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll pay my guys. Way. I'll... <laughs> subscribe to Club Twit so that we can podcast so we can from a go train. On nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all That's it is seven is bucks. Your seven bucks a month would allow us to do this show on a train. The Canadian Hickerton. Just twit.tv slash club twit. <laughs> Wait, what was the, who's the guy who does In a World? In a world that, where two podcasters that, are on a train. That announcer, he owns a train car and would do all of his recording from the train car. Are you kidding me? Attach different trains. No, you're kidding. No, this is correct. I need, what is I this? believe he's passed away. Chat room. Who is yeah, that? he passed Don away. Don LaFontaine. Yeah, he passed away some, some time ago. In a word. How'd you come up with that? Huh? Because I'm a professional announcer. No, you're good at Google. How did you do it? I just. Did you do his name? Yeah, no, I did. Because I've no, I've, I oh, okay. oh, actually right. keep track of these guys because I always want okay. to be them. Yep. And I have was practicing in a world. Uh, <laughs> I Is didn't know about the train, train though. Car? Let's see here. Yeah. It, um, I no, don't have a good source from this. Actually, what I was talking about last week, Dropout.tv, the uh, streaming network, they have one of their shows is a uh, kind of like this drinking game. It's kind of like Never Have I Ever. It's called Dirty Laundry. But in one of the episodes, one of the guests was talking about how they used to have to solicit donations for some fancy theater. And one of their first jobs is to call Don LaFontaine and ended up talking to him for hours. And he explained that he was calling from his train car where he lived and worked often and would hook it wow. onto different trains and kind of travel around the world or wow. around America. I think yeah. you need to write a little bit for Wikipedia because it's not in the Wikipedia. Listen, I'm going to go back and I will, uh, I'll go through one of these ad breaks. On LaFontaine yeah. train car, meet the epic, let's see here. Let's see. I mean, that's a wonderful story. And, and honestly, I have to up my ante because I was thinking maybe I'd get an Airstream and do, and do that. But now I want to train. Oh, yeah. Bill Especially Gates. You can just hook it on to whatever. Very famously. You know, Bill Gates, I don't know if he still does this, but for years would have a uh, uh, an event where he would bring, you know, not just Warren Buffett to play bridge, but very smart intellectuals and so forth. And they would all go somewhere. Esther Dyson was one of them. They would all go somewhere. Each of them was responsible for giving an evening presentation. And they would, you know, it would be an event. And they would go somewhere. And one year, it was a train across the country. Bill Gates got a, a series of private train cars. And these people all rode this train and, and did their little lectures at night on the train. And apparently, Warren and Bill... <laughs> Just spent the whole time playing bridge in one of the cars. It just never stopped. But that's another story for another day. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Well, that's a dream. It's a, it's a new dream. Tonight, dream about the train going across Canada through the Rockies. And we're talking about world destruction. What fun. It's and, great. And Don LaFontaine is Jeff on hits there. the, yeah, he hits the moral panic button. It's yeah. a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> I got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> um... In a world where laughter was king. Uh, no, in a world, Jack. One man. No. When your life is no longer your own. What, what does that mean? When everything you know is wrong. That's wrong. In an outpost. No. On the edge of space. No space. <laughs> and here is the advertisement uh, for our club twit. All aboard, ride the twit train rails with Leo and Paris and Jeff. Toot, toot, toot. And, and yep. I guess Ant yep. will have to go. Ant can be there. We have to ask Ant. Yeah, Ant's opted in. Yeah, he doesn't have a choice. Yeah, right. you you can't do this with Twit or Windows Weekly or anybody else because it's our idea. We have proprietary interest in this. <laughs> and also, clear. the other shows, Google, you know, you can make a cute little icon for it, and the O's in Google could be the train car wheels, oh, and you yes. can't do that with any of the other shows. <sighs> oh, that's so. right. That's Actually, right. funny yeah. thing you should mention that because in the early days of Google, I'm thinking it was, I don't know, 2008, 2005, it was a long time ago. I went to an event, Sergey and Larry were there, and the PR people handled us all Brio trains that spelled G-O-O-G-L-E. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you have that, don't you still? I thought I did. I was looking for it the other day. Somewhere. Yeah. I might have let the kids play with it, and they probably ate it. Google has <laughs> figured out a way to turn uh, noise-canceling earbuds into heart rate monitors. It's called audio plethysmography. Say that three times fast. Oh, uh, APG. Because uh, of the blood vessels in your ear, it's it, it turns out whatever's in your ear does a lot about you. And uh, the, the, the hardware that's in there for automatic uh, noise cancellation is or active noise cancellation is a microphone, right? And some com computational capability. Mm -hmm. It can actually use the same technology to measure your heart rate. Yeah, because when you put your head down on the pillow, you hear your heartbeat. It's, it's Makes there. sense. Yeah. Com compared to existing heart rate sensors, it's not impacted by skin tones, ear canal size, and suboptimal oh. seal conditions do not impact accuracy. So Google says this is a this is a better way to, to measure heart rate. There was a good article in Bloomberg this week, actually, about um, Apple. Uh Focusing on health and really that even when the Apple Watch first came out, even before uh, it was Steve Jobs hoped that this would be a health device doing things like blood sugar. But because uh, they were worried about FDA uh, regulation and they couldn't quite get it working, they made this be more about, oh, it's your phone's notifications and stuff like that. But uh, over time, it's become more of a health device. And apparently Apple's getting closer and closer to having it be blood pressure. Maybe next year will be blood pressure. Uh, what do you use your Apple Watch for mostly? Uh, well, uh, a lot of stuff. I have a lot of buttons on it. That do, I can unlock my car with that one. I can record Jeopardy with this one. Uh, I can text my wife with this button. With this button. Wow, everything can, you need. It's all on here. I can see when my next flight is and whether it's How delayed. How do you do any of that? All the time. I use this like crazy. Uh, it also tracks every... I press this button. It'll track my rowing workout. See, it's already doing it, even though I'm not even rowing. Mm, uh, wow. You're yeah. getting, you know, you're getting fitter by the second. By the second. I don't even have to row. I just press this button. <laughs> um, what else? I mean, it's... Uh, there's nothing it can't do. I actually love my you watch. You know, I, I think there's so do many things... Do you use any of the health features? Though? Yeah, the rowing thing's a health feature. It keeps track of no, my... The, 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 the I mean, text. that's like... Yeah, like the, uh, you know, heartbeat or whatever. Yeah, the I mean, it's like a pebble monitor. or something. It's like, you know, uh, it, tell you know, it, yeah. It's like a pedometer. <laughs> it's a fancy <laughs> pedometer. Um, there's, no, there's I love my symbols. Apple Watch. But you know what's funny? They, Before the, you have a, a, a uh, epileptic seizure, there are, there are yes. free signals that come over someone. My mother was a brittle diabetic since I was born and her, her skin would get clammy. We knew more she was and more. An reaction, and you right? know, and those, you, those use a, you use a cardia. There's this, there's the I two. use a cardia, absolutely. Yeah, for AFib. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, though. This uh, I'm going to watch. I'm going to there. It is. There's the cardia. It's now a what credit card size device. It'll. It's it amazing. does. This is. Oh, I have AFib. 
Does an AKG and so this EKG. checks my car, EKG. It's a it's yeah. a it's a doctor accepted EKG to my phone. Two mon two, two leads. Interesting. We learned in the Google trial. This Google trial has been a uh, treasure trove of information that uh, Apple could have and thought about making all the Apple Watch and all of its apps available on Android, but decided it would be bad for business. So they didn't. Uh, let me see if I can find that story. I didn't. I don't think I. I, I mean, they were right. <laughs> they were it's right. The same thing with why they are keeping green techs. Yeah. It's annoying, and I hate it. But, but they're right. Yep. Um. Yeah, I thought I had uh, bookmarked this. It's here somewhere. I don't see it. I think you did. It was at the top of the. It's in here, isn't it? Yeah. Is where it is there? it? I'm looking. I'm but looking. It was the first it one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Apple Watch faces potential oh, yeah. import. It's the first one. Google. Yeah. Oh, this is the one of Google uh, asking Apple to preload its search app on iOS. Oh, Google, similar but different. But Apple said no. But according to The Verge, Tim Cook thought about it at least once. I have no idea how they knew that. <laughs> Maybe they saw an email. I don't know. Uh, Sundar Pichai was testifying in this uh, Google versus the Department of Justice case, and so there was a lot of good, juicy stuff in his uh, testimony. Do you have any sense of how the trial's going? I do not. Um, this, uh, you know, even if it goes well for Google, these these are always problematic because of so much stuff being revealed in Discovery. We saw this with Apple and Epic that it's embarrassing for everybody involved. In this case, it's the Department of Justice, so it's not embarrassing for them. But um, I, 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 that's a good question. Is this, I can't remember, is this a judge only or is there a jury as well? I can't remember. I can't remember. There's so many trials, I'm so confused. For some reason, I think this is a judge only, but I may be wrong. I think it is a judge only yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, I think they've made a good case. I agree with it somewhat. I don't think there's anything wrong with Google giving Apple, as we've now learned, $18 billion a couple of years ago and something maybe even more every year since to be the default search engine. That's a lot of money. Uh, but, you know, don't doesn't Cap'n Crunch give grocery stores money to be an end? Exactly. An end cap yeah. on, in the grocery store? I mean, I, I don't know what would be illegal about that. Okay, I've got an answer. Um it's a bench trial, so it there's is a bench no trial. jury, right. and you've got a presiding judge that's going to give the final ruling. Right. Along with Pichai, though, Google is planning to call at least 10 other witnesses. Yes. And it's supposed to last till the end of November, so we got some some more updates to give you. There is, you know, the government bears the burden of proof to show Google harmed competition. I'm reading from NPR.org. Its case centers on claims that Google illegally orchestrated its business dealings to ensure that it's the first engine people see when they turn on their phones or computers, like paying Apple $18 billion. To me, that doesn't, that seems like normal business practice. Mm -hmm. It's not like you, it's not like you're using your monopoly power to keep others out of the business, or are you? Maybe you are. Well, and Apple's screwed if, if it goes against It's a lot Google. of money. It's a big percentage of Apple's services and, revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Pure yeah, profit. but I mean, also from just a, like, this would have profound effects for every other, you know, company out there that does this. This is a fairly standard practice. I mean, do you think that this would, if it came down against Google, do you think this would have the sort of impact that it would impact things like what we're talking about, Captain Crunch, paying to have a higher placement on a grocery shelf. The difference arguably is... Arguably, it's pretty similar. Yeah, I think the difference is, and the reason it's an antitrust thing, is that Google's dominant in the market, right? And did they did they create that dominance this way, and are they maintaining it this way? I don't know. I I mean... Devil's advocate, I guess the I guess the, the response would be they... They created such an un, uh, unsurmountable barrier to entry exactly. for any competitor to go to Apple. And in fact, DuckDuckGo's testifying. Uh, Microsoft, Satya Nadella was there testifying on behalf of Bing. Um, Nadella said during his testimony, everybody talks about the open web, but there's really the Google web. The distribution advantage Google has today doesn't go away. Neva, remember my favorite little search engine that could, that had finally had to go out of the business because they couldn't compete against Google? They testified. 
that Google's exclusive deals effectively quashed their potential game market share. Uh, and, you know, I think there's some point to that. Well, yeah, but it was, but, mm. oh, yeah, Apple's going to drop Google for Neva. No. Sorry, I know you loved it, but no, not going to happen. Well, but maybe if Apple made it, for instance, there's never been a way that I could make Neva the search engine on my iPhone. I had to use a special Neva app to do that. Um if Apple could you make didn't other accept things eighteen engine? billion dollars from Google, and and at least had a switch in there that would let me choose any other search engine, um, I think it's fine for them to be the default. But I think that it shouldn't be hard to switch. By the way, that's one of the points of contention. Google says it's easy to switch. You could change the default, uh, and the Department of Justice says not so easy. It's fifteen clicks, that kind of thing. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where I come down on this. I think, I don't know. It's un think The other thing NPR says, and I agree, it's unclear how, if Judge Mehta rules in favor of the Justice Department, how he would sanction Google. I mean, how big of a fine can you give them that would make, make would hurt them? Do you I restructure mean, the company? Fine? Would they try and, yeah, do some sort of restructuring? Yeah. It's... Hmm. But I don't know if that's justified. This is not, I mean, it, you know, I, don't, I don't know. And 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 I guess part of what Pachai and Google have been saying is that they've improved the web. And I think that is still essentially true. Um, they made the web accessible. People could be found. Things could happen as a result. Uh, the connections were possible. Um, there, There is also, and I put this in the uh, uh, show notes as well. Let me see if I can find it. Um, there was testimony google's code yellow in 2019 this is from bloomberg blurred the line between search and ads there was a, a kind of a dispute between the person in charge of search ben gomez uh who was called by the company its defense to show that there was a uh, a chinese wall between ad sales and search you know the the real to me this is the real fundamental issue does google do things to benefit its ad sales in search results that would be bad right they should be separated and google thinks so too in fact as i've mentioned before larry page in his original page rank article said we should never sell ads because that would totally corrupt the results so um gomez was brought in to testify, but they also brought up an email that Gomez wrote to other executives that his search team was, quote, getting too close to the money. He wrote, I think it's good for us to aspire to query growth and to aspire to more users, but I think we're getting too involved with ads for the good of the product and the company. He's worried that, the, that this division, this line between ad sales and search is getting weaker and uh, by the way, I should point out, you know, his his battle was with uh, Prabhakar Raghavan, who was head of advertising. Um, you know, Raghavan said, you got to do more to help us. You know, our ad sales numbers are going down. You got to do more to help us. And Gomez is saying, no, well, no. Or it might, might be Gomez. It's probably Gomez. Gomez is saying, no. Uh, you know, we have to preserve our integrity. Um, the the, the uh, <laughs> final... <laughs> blow in all of this is is gomez left in 2020 and raghavan now runs both search and advertising oof oof <laughs> now maybe there's still a good chinese wall between the two but you know the same guy's running both and the guy who in 2019 was saying you got to help us uh Raghavan wrote to Gomes asking for a meeting saying the core query softness continues without mitigation. At this rate, the full year plan is a bad miss, the revenue plan, and we'll need drastic steps on the query side. you got to help us make more money. Gomes drafted a response to Raghavan that he shared with other executives acknowledging, quote, feeling annoyed both personally and on behalf of the team. He's trying to protect the integrity of search against the ad department. Most headcount, he wrote, non-assistant, for search has gone into projects that are growth-oriented. To the point, I worry we are really not investing in research or speculation adequately. 
we could increase queries quite easily in the short term in user negative ways. And he gave some examples. You know, if we turned off spell correction, for instance, uh, turn off ranking improvement, there's ways we could make more money. But he didn't want to do that. Gomes said in his testimony Tuesday, he believed, this was yesterday, that Raghavan was implying uh, Gomes' team, the search team, hadn't done enough. But he said, Gomes said, they would never have taken steps that would negatively impact users, like turning off spell correction. He said he never sent the email. He just, he was writing it to get it off his chest, but he did show it to other executives. Gomes and Raghavan met and agreed to stop using queries as a metric, instead creating a new metric that measures groups of queries. But, I mean, the judge has got to be left with the impression that you just were, Paris. And you're telling me Raghavan now runs search and ads. Hmm. It's also fascinating. I mean, obviously, in these sort of cases, everything is part of discovery. But it's fascinating to see cases like this that an email draft is even playing even that. a big role. Yeah. I think had he not shown it to other executives to verify that he had written it, it might not have made it into the discovery. But... It was, you know, too many people had seen it. Don't, this is the rule in companies, right? I don't know if, I don't know if it's the rule in your erase, company. Erase, erase, erase. No, no, don't even put it in writing in the first place. Right, 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 right. Can the we Donald Trump rule? Can, yeah, yeah, can we talk out in the parking lot? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, whenever I'm talking to employees at tech companies, uh, I say, don't use anything relating to any of your work devices whatsoever. Yeah, use that because... signal number at the bottom of the page. Okay, use a signal number, but don't use signal on your right. work given Google phone. That's right. an issue. That's a thing that a lot of my colleagues have had to deal with before. And yeah, shocking. All right, your I want to take a break, but when we come back, more from that trial, including, and you never get to see this, the most lucrative queries, the most lucrative search queries, but it's as of just one week, September 22nd, 2018. But this was in Discovery. So it's the only one we've ever seen. They've never made it public before. Uh, in fact, Judge Meta was, you know, this was one of the things that Google said, please, Your Honor, can we keep this a secret? And Judge Meta was going, ah, I don't know, finally said, you know what, this should be public information. And so now we have it. The Verge published it. I will talk about it when we come back. Paris Martineau, Jeff Jarvis, you're watching this week in Google. We got Google stuff. How did I was that saying, happen? we got a lot of Google stuff here, oh, you know. I'm so sorry. Maybe this is a show about Google. You want to talk about my dream some more? Yeah. Our show today brought to you by Miro. Now, this is a good solution. In fact, it, there is a Google tie-in. Because as you remember, Google killed that jam board, that, that whiteboard that you would roll around from office to office. They $5,000 companies paid for it. It's going to be uh, sunsetted. But what did Google tell people? Uh, you know, just use Miro instead. They literally said that. And you know what? It's a lot less than $5,500. It's the online workspace for innovation. It doesn't have to be in your office. It's somewhere everybody on the team can see it, no matter what time zone they're in, no matter what location. But what is an online workspace for innovation when it's at home exactly? How can it help you? Well, let me explain. Miro is one incredible visual, very important place, that brings all your innovative work together no matter where you're located. And it's packed you can use it for a lot of things, but it's packed with the right things, for example, to be your dream product's home base. Just for that alone, we're talking six whole capability bundles from product development workflows to content visualization, all powered by Miro AI. Now, this is a good use of AI, especially for brainstorming, coming up with thoughts and ideas, prompts. You're generating new ideas. You're summarizing. Oh, it's a great thing for that, too to take existing information and summarize it pretty much instantly. That AI is amazing. Miro can work for any team, but product development teams really get the full experience. It offers teams the richest feature set of any visual workspace with specific tools to help with strategy or process mapping, facilitation tools to run effective design or agile sprints, and on and on. You get the picture. Miro connects super seamlessly the platforms you're already using. Uh, we use Jira. It works with Jira, Confluence. We use Google. We use Google Docs. We use Zapier. It works with Asana. You could central and on and on. I mean, there's literally dozens of integrations. You can centralize your work in a way that makes sense for your team. They don't need to leave Miro to update projects or statuses in any of these tools. You do it all through Miro. It means you have a single source of truth that's there day or night, any time of the day, any time of night. So 
It's really a great way for your team to stay in touch, to stay on top of it. In fact, you can even have your team uh, deliver comments uh, asynchronously with a new feature called Talk Track. It's a board video recording feature. Pre-recording your thoughts, leaving it on the board instead of scheduling yet another meeting uh, is a great way to, co to work together, to collaborate. And it is a massive time saver. I mean, just eliminate those meetings alone is huge. Miro users reported saving up to 80 hours a year. That's two weeks a year per user by streamlining conversations, cutting down on meetings. And really what's most useful seeing the single source of truth, the most up-to-date information all in one place. You don't have to go from tool to tool. You know you're seeing it all right there. I'm not surprised Google suggested people turn to Miro to replace their jam boards. It's better. Go on. Try it out for yourself. Get your first three boards for free to start working better. Miro.com slash podcast. And there's no little wobbly wheel on the bottom that goes bub, 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 as you're rolling your board around. Everybody can see it. Miro. I'm joking. Miro. M-I-R-O dot com slash podcast. Thank you, Miro, for supporting. This week in Google, they got a great product. We use it ourselves. So, this week, The Verge writes, during the U.S. versus Google antitrust trial, we got a rare glimpse at a closely guarded secret. Which search terms make the most money? Now, admittedly, this is five years ago. This is from 2018. Uh, the list is ordered by revenue and nothing else. The Verge says, still, we've never seen anything quite like this before. The top 20 queries, again, remember, five years ago, number one, moneymaker, iPhone 8. <laughs> number two, <laughs> iPhone 8 Plus. Okay. So when people search for iPhone 8, they will see ads for cases, maybe for iPhones, maybe for different sellers. And those ads make Google money. In fact, the most money that week. Auto insurance was next, followed by car insurance. So that makes sense. When people search for insurance, they're searching to find a company. So those I, ads. I still watch old fashioned TV and the number of insurance ads big that money. go by on MSNBC. Yeah. Oh, God, it just never ends. But don't try to get. I do think it's interesting that it, iPhone 8 and iPhone 8 Plus are at the top because that indicates to me that it's just people searching for the iPhone because they want to buy it because it just came out that week. Yeah. And they're just clicking the first search result. And so Apple's having to pay for that. Oh, which is, I didn't uh, think of that. <laughs> I mean, it, this list this week, it, when this list came out, is... Um, it's the week the, week the iPhone, iPhone came iPhone out. Was yeah, September 22nd. And of course, yeah. People who are searching for an iPhone 8 or iPhone 8 Plus want to buy that. It's dumb that Apple has to buy an ad to get people to click on their website so that they can buy the product they're searching for. But that's how. Oh, so let, let me ask you work. and Lisa a question, Leo. Because I've you seen mean uh, you mean when Paris for, or my wife? No, 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 your wife. Okay. Um, when I Lisa's not question. here, but okay. Well, yes. I'm, okay. But I'll channel her. Channel her. Yes. Channel her. Yes. Um, Karnak the Magnificent. Um, something Paris has no idea what that means. Uh, when I search for Twit on Google, we buy um, ads. Yeah, why do you buy it under Twit? Because you are the first organic response. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't get any ads when I search for Twit on Google, but maybe it's because I don't. Have, I get a I sponsored get... ad. Uh, I just searched Twit. Uh, I just get. Twit, a silly or foolish person, and then... <laughs> Great. <laughs> Very good. That seems right. Why That's do I, I get the ad? Well, huh. uh, we must be trying to get you. We do buy Google saying, ads. You must be in the demographic. I don't know what our budget is. Uh, I don't... Uh, I, try not to, I try not to ask, but I, we do have a marketing budget. And yeah. uh, I don't get involved because if it were me, <laughs> I would say... We don't need to advertise. <laughs> What's <laughs> for me? I would have no marketing department at all. I would Ooh. say there is only one uh, thing we should spend money on, which is making the best content we can, and, and then people will just find us. But that's why I didn't do so well until Lisa came along. I guess yeah. we do have a marketing department. I yeah, it's I just okay, I'm not I have big a question on marketing. For you guys, yeah, are you ever swayed by? Let's just say Google search ads. Do you guys, one, pay attention to Google search ads? Do you notice when they are there? Do you notice that they are different from Google search results? And do you click on them? 
Jeff? Depends on whether I like the company or not. If I really like the company, I won't cost them money. Oh, I do the same thing. Beep. I'll go down to the organic result instead yes. of clicking the ad because it's going to cost them money. I don't like the company. If it's Verizon, I'm clicking on the ad. Again and again. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is also how I feel about display ads, too. Is yes. I, one, I don't think about them at all, and I don't click on them because I don't want... This is how I think about Instagram ads. If I see something I like on an Instagram ad, do not click on it. I will search on a different browser. Or I'm worse on. than that. I will actively close my eyes <laughs> and skip it. I do that on Twitter, too. So as I'm scrolling through Twitter, up in the upper right-hand corner where it's an ad, it'll say ad. And as soon as I see that, I uh, I don't look at it. I quickly scroll past it. Like says ad there. I don't look at that. I go next one. I actively, yeah. and that's, I shouldn't should say that because we're ad supported. Ladies in the bikinis, Leo, it would help. I do. I close my eyes. <laughs> well, maybe if Elon look. Musk was reading the copy for each one of those ads on Twitter to your ears, you'd be into it. There's one ad that uh, constantly comes up on Twitter. Twitter has really become the place for AI and crypto bros. There's one ad that says, oh, I don't yeah. know anything has about become? it. Has <laughs> become? There's one ad I see it every, all the time that says, I don't know, I'm an idiot when it comes to AI, but my boss thinks I'm brilliant. Click. <laughs> 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 click. Because I read click. <laughs> uh, I skipped that one. Anyway, auto insurance. Okay, number one, two, three, four, five, cheap flights. That makes sense. And this is, by the way, can, I think this, this, piece of uh, evidence really is for Google to say, we put ads next to e-commerce searches that when somebody's searching for something, it makes us the most money when we put an ad next to that. Car insurance quotes, direct TV, this is the rest of them, online colleges, AT&T, Hulu, iPhone. So it's iPhone 8, iPhone Plus, and then a little lower down, iPhone. So Uber. when people type in iPhone, Paris, to your, to your theory... Are they just lazy and type it in, or do they want reviews and, and they don't want to go to Apple, or they want news okay, and they but want to go to Apple? I I would have thought that it would have been reviews or something more. I don't know that the query was more interesting than that. But based on the fact that these are the highest revenue generating search terms, I assume they're clicking on iPhone, which the first thing that's coming up on the weekend iPhone launch is has to be Apple, right? Yeah, yeah. You, I'll yeah. tell you my theory. For most browsers now, that you don't go to Google.com and do a search. You type it right up here in the address bar, right? You just type iPhone. Well, let's also talk. It's you, you don't do it there. You do it on mobile, or on mobile. Same thing. But let me yeah. just let me just finish my theory. That's not because you want to do a search. It's because you want to. Go, you know, when I, I I'll never forget going into Yahoo. And the number one they have, they, remember this? They used to have a list in the, in the lobby of the top searches. The number one search was Google. <laughs> people, you got to remember how people work and watch people. Watch, uh, you know, we're technology focused. We care about this more. But watch how people, they type the thing they want. They type, they don't type yahoo.com. They type Yahoo. They don't type google.com. Right, they type right, Google. Right, they don't right, type apple.com. Right. They type iPhone. Because they know, and they do it in the address bar, because they don't know what the address is. They know that the first result, I just did it for iPhone, is going to be the Apple site. And they click that. And, and I think an that's ad. how that people... Not no, but I think that's how people use the browser. Uh, I, so I think that the top searches are people who just don't... We don't... Nobody types in a URL. You don't even. You don't type .com. Well, HTTPS colon slash slash... I put in N and it fills out New York Times. I yeah. put in TH and it fills out The Guardian. W, mm -hmm. Washington Same. Post. Same thing for me. I type N and yeah. I get Neva.com. It is wild to me that this many people are searching cheap flights. That is a, it's a baffling thing to search to me. I mean, not that I don't like cheap flights, but I've never thought of just typing in the words cheap, cheap flights? flights Have you ever into typed a search engine. Have you ever typed Thai restaurants near you? Is that one of the top ones? Do you ever do oh, that? Oh, you're doing a different story. Sorry. Do you ever do no. that, Paris, where you type? Uh, I do that all the time. Oh, I, I I'm at, I'm at oh, a I place. I, don't, I type breakfast near me. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I guess I'd put me. that in Google Maps, but yeah. 
No, you do it in your browser. Yeah, both. You I would type. Both. I will just put food. Or you, or you don't even type it in. Up. You go. Or, 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 or Paris, I go to Google Maps. Breakfast with, uh, knows near the hotel me. And I say near me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, a yeah. near me button. Look, IHOP, Denny's, Jack in the Box. I didn't even go to a browser. That was He uh, lives Siri. in a really classy place there. These are all literally yeah. just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so what, was I telling you you should go visit? Maybe not. So there are places. <laughs> there are dentists. There are notaries. There are plumbers. There are restaurants who have named their business near me. <laughs> this is Thai food near me, <laughs> which I'm going to bet <laughs> is probably in Brooklyn, but I don't know. Uh, Teddy uh, Jirapawanamanamanamanam, uh, one of four owners, thought back to his own experience using Google to find restaurants. Everywhere I go, he says, I'm craving Thai food. I have to search Thai food near me all the time. So he named his New York-based restaurant... <laughs> Thai food near me. Brilliant. It is brilliant, but it probably doesn't work. Danny Sullivan, who's the uh, search engine liaison now at Google, formerly of Search Engine Land, and until he started working for the dark side, a regular on our show, says there are many businesses like this. It probably doesn't help. There is, uh, this is from a great article in The Verge. By the way, good enterprise reporting from Mia Sato. Said, you know... I wonder if there are other places like this. She <laughs> she says, among the businesses I was able to find a chain of half a dozen affordable dentists near me in Texas, antiques near me just outside of the city, seven plumbers near me businesses, a phone repair <laughs> near me in Cape Cod, a psychic near me in Chicago, and more than 20 notary near me across the U.S. Uh, she talked to a guy I named Felix kind of Silver stories. who named... His barber shop in Coral Springs, Florida, barber shop near me. <laughs> <laughs> but Danny says, "Yeah, you know, I got to be honest with you. We, it's the name is not the most important part in the near me search." He says, uh, "Actually, you know, we consider where you are among other things uh, and reviews." So Mia asked uh, Danny, uh, "Does it actually bump?" your restaurant up among its nearby competitors. I doubt it, says Danny. He didn't know. I doubt it. Uh, owners doing this might find success, but Google pulls in other data to serve results to users like locations, reviews, or ratings. Uh, quote, hodgepodge of different things we have that are out there. So. I mean, it reminds me of uh, the tech, like, I, a couple of years ago, was looking for an exterminator. I think I typed in exterminators near me yes. on Google Maps. There were quite a few in my neighborhood. So I brought the little mystery bug I had in a bag over to one of them. <laughs> oh, it's a, you know. It's, it's a, a Monstera Delicioso. It's iced tea shop, yeah. you know. Like it, and then I was like, okay, well, this one doesn't exist. I was going to go to the next one. Oh, it's a, you know, library. Wait a minute. None of them actually existed in real they life. They were made up they exterminators? They all were. No, they were real exterminators in the New York metro area that had decided to squat on certain Whoa. locations in Google Maps. How does that help In them? order to, no, so that people like me would look that up. They didn't expect you to go there. They thought you'd they call. They didn't expect right. me to bring a bug <laughs> to their location. Well, they didn't want uh, you to. I ended up having to text. They didn't want me to. Well, but florist, apparently, I remember asking some folks about it. And That's yeah, hysterical. florists do the same thing. It's yeah, a, yeah. a like growth hacking technique. So here's here's something weird. So, so I, I looked up at our, our, our big mall nearby, so it's chains. And uh, the Mexican restaurant there is Uncle Julio's. So I typed in Uncle Julio's Bridgewater. What came up, the first three listings, the first one is headlined, Mexican food near me, Bridgewater NJ. It's their, um, their URL. The next oh. one is menu, limited Bridgewater. The next one is tacos and margaritas near me in Bridgewater. And it's their URL going directly. Wait a minute, their URL is that. taco Near it's me. Not their URL. It's not their URL. No, no, no. I'm saying the headline says tacos and margaritas near me in Bridgewater, New Jersey, but the the, the listing is to their URL. Oh. Yes. With because their logo. Yeah, because Google, that's not them. That's that's Google saying, well, he, Google. here's where you are. And here's it's actually smart enough not to be fooled, in other words, by the restaurant's name. Unlike Paris Martineau, who brought a bug to a taco shop. <laughs> yeah. yeah it didn't turn out to be bed bugs though so oh really that's happy. a relief what was oh, it good. 
I don't remember. It was yeah. a mystery the small bug. Plant. It was like Isn't that scary though? Ago. Don't you It was terrifying. I had just moved in too, so it was yeah. an empty apartment, me, a scary. mattress, a bug. Nightmare. Lisa doesn't want to go to Paris, speaking of Paris, anymore because of the stories that there's bed bugs. You know where those stories came from? I haven't told her this yet. Russian disinformation. Yeah. What? Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, I got fooled. Uh, me too, and so did Lisa. What's behind, this is uh, from yellowpages.com. What's behind Paris's bud, bed bug panic? And not Paris Martineau, Paris, France. The outbreak ahead of the Olympics likely do. No, no, no. This is wrong. This is this is um, this is their, they, this is a story where they fell for it. Let me find the. Uh, wow. Yeah. I got got. You got got. I think we all got got. Well, I saw stories about Parisians going nuts for no reason. I saw that in the middle. Yeah. First was the. Oh my God! It's bed bugs all over Paris. The next one was, well, no, there isn't, and French people are nutty. And now here's the, well, there's why they're nutty. This is from the Independent. Bed bug panic could have been spread by Russia, French intelligence. Well, maybe consider the sources French intelligence. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you could say that as a guy with a French name. Yeah, he's allowed to. You know, we have two out of three of the hosts on this show are French. Jeff. It's true. We're coming for you, Jeff. <laughs> there was a Jeff. um there was a a border guard in Canada who said that your name like everything else it was in, in Quebec. They, the the English ruined your name. It should be Gervais. Ooh. But actually of- my name should be Riley. Oh. If my great grandfather had made my great grandmother an honest woman as they said in the day, my name would be Riley. So the stories of uh, blood-sucking critters were fake news stories for the most part that were then shared across social media uh, kind of brilliant by Russian military hey, let's sources. Let's get the French. Well, yeah. How perfect, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, part of the reason is, this, not what you would expect, the most commonly used anti-bed bug agent in furniture and wood materials is made in Russia. No, and that due to no. san- yes, no. and that due to sanctions imposed on the substance because of the uh, invasion of Ukraine, spraying had stopped. Um, so that that led to stories sanctions against Russia have led to epidemics of bed bugs in Paris, but and and it was claimed that this came from a, a, a newspaper called La Montagne. La Montagne said no, we never published such an article. Those were forged. So these are forged articles, which were apparently spread by Russian social media groups. Maybe wow. they maybe they want to increase oh. sales of. Um, you never you never should have had those sanctions. You're getting punished. Um, Speaking of getting got, I did you guys see going around Twitter this week the uh, courtroom sketch of. I can only describe it as hot Sam Bankman Freed, kind of a. (laughs) (laughs) An impossibility, Paris. An impossibility. impossibility. I've posted a a screenshot of one of the tweets in the chat, uh, in the Discord live chat. Um, There were a lot of different memes going around with the court sketch on the right (laughs) of what some might describe as Chad SBF. And (laughs) it really took off as far as a meme format. This is a great Um, post from Sophie, who is NetCap Girl on Twitter. The actual picture of Sam Bankman Freed, net income, and the and the. And the courtroom, this is the actual sketch from the courtroom? No, I oh. got got. It's not. It's, oh. I think, by AI or something. Oh, that's hysterical. It, it's taken off everywhere, though. It's very funny because she says, net income, the real picture, adjusted a beta, the hot picture. Uh, yeah. I wish that were true. No, I saw, I remember seeing the courtroom sketches. They are not flattering to anyone, actually. They <laughs> make everyone look terrible. Awful. Yeah. yeah, real bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is not, by the way, that trial is not going well for him or Michael Lewis, <laughs> I feel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael, of course, wrote Going Infinite, the book about Sam Bankman Fried, which essentially became an apolog- apologia for, uh, you know, saying, oh, he was just misunderstood. Well, I don't know if he was misunderstood. His uh, his own testimony in the trial does not did not encourage so I think he's I think he's gonna I don't know, but I think he's gonna get the book thrown against him. 
Uh, here is the. Uh, this is. This is the actual it's life, it's like courtroom really sketch. Life in prison, right? Really hot, right? Oof. Oof. <laughs> Good looking that fella. Looks like a cave painting. <laughs> I love that it says Bitcoin coming out of his mouth there. You know, it's hysterical. <laughs> it looks like that painting. Remember when the the French woman decided to fix the damaged uh, fresco? Yes. Yeah, That's yeah. what this yeah, looks yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like the messed up painting of Jesus Christ. Exactly. Um. But that's, I think it's really funny that Michael Lewis, the uh, author of um, that rather flattering Sam Bakeman Freed book, is sitting in the SBF friends and family box at the courtroom. Really? He's not sitting with the journalists <laughs> in the press box. Here's uh, another uh, fake, right? Here's the fake sketch of SBF and the actual courtroom sketch of his girlfriend <laughs> who testified against him, which was, I remember seeing this. And thinking, that poor woman, that is so unflattering. These sketches are hideous. It's kind that of is... an accurate picture, actually. Oh, Oof. come on. She was not. Okay, yeah, she doesn't she look that. She was a bad day. Yeah. 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 I think that is an artist interpretation of her mood, mood probably, yeah. in the courtroom. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is from uh, Slate. A little ske sketched out. The courtroom sketches from SPF's crypto scandal aren't just dolly level weird. They're the best part of the trial. <laughs> uh, it, this is uh, Jane Rosenberg uh, of Reuters who's doing these sketches. Um, wow. I, you know, in her defense, you, you got to be quick. <laughs> you know what I love? The sketches on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, I love that. I want this to hang on the wall, to be honest. When I covered the uh, chat GPT lawyer hearing, there was a sketch artist there. I never saw it get out in the news. But it's great. She has a, you know, the jury box is empty, so she gets the best seat in the jury box and gets there and, and perfectly privileged about how to do it. It's kind of fun to watch. Yeah. How long do you think she has to, to do this? This is pretty quick, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can get Jane on the show. <laughs> the art. Do you want and your own? You, you, I want you my get own. your own sketch. <gasps> oh, that oh, would you be? So would great. you be all right with the uh, with the results if they're that horrifying? We want we want the guilty Leo look. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, bet yeah. the ashamed and guilty. Look. I bet we could get Mid Journey to to do one of those. Oh well, I I, I think right now, hey, even as real you speak artists. in the chat, I might even get a sticker. <laughs> Yeah, it might well be happening. All right, we never got through all twenty-two of the, but I think you got the idea. Insurance is in there a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was surprised, frankly, at how boring most of those searches were, or all of those searches were. I think, but I guess that's they're there what to confirm money. Google's point of view, which is look, Life we don't mess up our search results for for advertising. Only a small fraction of our search results have ads on them, and they're almost always. This style e-commerce search. That's that's where we make our money. Oh, uh, look at this. We do, in fact, have. Thank you, Burke. The courtroom sketch of uh, of Leo <laughs> on acid. Uh, somebody that's said the magic this. mushrooms view. That uh, that's Leo dreaming. Yeah. Yeah, this that's is, your dream. I had a dream. Oofa. Yeah. Where do we wow. keep this now? Far away from you. Far, far away. Thank you. <laughs> In a closet yeah. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why just leave it there? <laughs> sure. Last week it was Jeff's beautiful picture. Now this week it's my Great. Courtroom. A multimedia experience. Courtroom sketch. Oh, did you see that we work uh, going chapter 11 tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a ride. What a the ride. The stock is ride. down. No. Shockingly. <laughs> I saw a Bloomberg headline that says we were filed for bankruptcy, stock slumps. And I was like, ooh, yeah. who would have guessed? Wow. Well, when they, you know what? Uh, that is a surprise because didn't it go up when they announced, hey, we're not doing that well? It went up. I remember that. Thinking it would be bought or something? N you know what? I no think it's because retail traders are a bit yeah, wild. Dumb. It was yeah. a stonk. Um, X launches two new subscriptions. We now have three, actually four oh. tiers of uh, of subscriptions to Elon Musk's S. The premium Plus. Premium Plus. You get uh, pr uh, Premium, which is the blue check, for $8. Premium Plus, which is $16. 
And then there's $3 basic subscription. Who would get a $3 basic subscription? Who would get any of them. And then there's the $1 not a bot subscription, which he's testing out. How, let me ask you both a question. When you see someone's verified on Twitter, what do you think of them? Less. Yes. I think you're a sucker. I think you paid Elon eight bucks for that check, and why? So being able to write longer. Well, there's I guess a, yeah. There's I benefits. see colleagues or yeah, like peers is... in the media use it so that they can DM people. But I'm not sure that being able to cold DM people is that useful. Oh, I got the calling feature, by the way. I'm waiting for somebody to call me. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> How, where do you see it, Leo? It just popped up the, uh, a couple of days ago. I went to Twitter, and there, there's a pop-up saying, would you like to turn that on? Paris, do you have it? I mean, I also got the pop-up. I didn't read it, though. Yeah, that was the pop-up. Uh, so you were getting offered yeah. it. Yeah. I don't need anyone calling me through Twitter. No. What I have seen people complain about is uh, that because Blue Checks and now this whatever this new premium subscription is, uh, is it gets promoted in replies their replies are just jammed with these horrible blue check people and that's a potential side effect that's not so good right oh, it's a mess the premium plus builds on the perks that come with x's standard premium plan formerly twitter blue which includes a blue check mark you should get a different color but okay the ability to edit tweets longer posts longer video uploads encrypted direct messages and the, quote, largest reply boost, plus no ads. <sighs> I wonder, I really wonder how much money he makes on this. Elon himself has effectively admitted that the value of Twitter has gone down by 50% since he bought it. He bought it More for, than that, from well, 44 to 16. 16 billion. Yeah. Uh, and he did that in, in a stock offering. Uh, and that's to, still high. Yeah. So here's yeah. Your... I mean, I I can't remember what the last tally was of uh, people who subscribed to Twitter Blue, but it was low. It was something that was like negligible um, in terms of the company's overall revenue. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Uh, how long before the banks come a calling? Fidelity, uh, which I think put almost half a billion dollars into Twitter, has has written that amount down to considerably less is he paying the i think he's paying it he has to if not he's got he could get foreclosed on couldn't he well, let me check what fidelity's current is for twitter i've got a little service that'll do this oh a real reporter here it's very handy to have. it's so nice let me know her. have you done all your research on matter and you know are you now really up on the matter standard I thought about it, and then I was like, I could spend my time doing anything else. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Uh, Stacy, by the way, is going to be back uh, tomorrow. Stacy's book club, even though Stacy Higginbotham, our former co-host, has given up podcasting, her own podcast as well as this one. She did say, you know what, I want to keep doing the book club. So, And she's doing John Scalzi's Kaiju Preservation Society uh, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific. So if you do miss Stacy, or you want to know more about Matter, uh, there you go, 9 a.m. tomorrow in the club. Now, if you're not a club member, this is a great opportunity for you to, to give us $7. It really makes a difference to our bottom line. Um, it's really tough right now in the podcast business. Gimlet is gone. WNYC has given up on podcasting. I wonder, you know, Joe Rogan's contract will be up soon. They gave him, we don't know, we think at least $100 million dollars to be exclusive to Spotify. And I'd uh, be interested to see if they continue to give him that kind of money. I'm sure he wants more. Uh, and all I know is advertising is disappearing, but that's good because it means we can be supported by you, our listeners. We would love that. If you are not yet a member of Club Twit, seven bucks a month, you get access to all the special programming we put on Club Twit. Not just Stacy's Book Club, but the Untitled Linux Show, Hands on Macintosh, Hands on Windows, Home Theater Geeks. We did a great escape box event last Thursday. It was so much fun. We've got a fireside chat with Renee Ritchie from YouTube, former host on MacBreak Weekly. He's now YouTube's creator liaison. He'll be joining us uh, in two weeks, November 16th. Jeff and I will be joined by Doc Searles and Steve Gibson for our annual holiday show. You'll be able to see that on the holiday, but you get to watch the taping December 7th, which should be a lot of fun. 
Go to twit.tv slash club twit. Join the club. Join the Discord. It's a lot of fun in there. And uh, and we would love to have your support. Thank you in advance. Twit.tv slash club twit. Yeah, club see, members Leo got to see nice you guys way. not escape a room. Hey. Oh. We got out. You made a valiant effort. We got out after an hour and 43. Eventually. Did you watch that? <laughs> you heard I watched about part it. of it. Yeah. It I was a little it. long. It went on a little long. Yeah. Oh, the, sorry. The book club is next Thursday. Did I say? I did say tomorrow. It's tomorrow. not tomorrow. It's next Thursday. I apologize. Tomorrow, you can watch AI Inside. Unfortunately, I won't be there because I'm recording the book, but always watch. Yeah. Right? Jason All Howell club is. All members, watch Jason. This is something we can do because of the club members. They give us a chance to expand and, and create new shows, and so that's appreciated. Yeah, well, it was fun. So it was a box with lots of padlocks on it and stuff from a company that does escape rooms, and so this they bring to companies. Uh, it was hard, but we. I think we did. I think we did all right. I think it was fun. It was certainly fun for us. Did any of you guys break break down emotionally? I physically? cried. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Nice. At when the when the hour went by, because that's what they that was the nominal time to escape. Uh, I I really felt like it's I it's over. I give up. <laughs> Fortunately, but, none of the, the other room continued. The, none of the other people would give up, and I said, "All right, all right, we'll keep going." Uh, there was some really clever, really clever puzzles in there. I really had. Wait, wait, it's a service; they bring you the box. Yeah, so I think oh. escape rooms, which are now really all over the place, are often used by companies as as a team building exercise. Oh, I would hate that. God, I would hate that. <laughs> It's fun. Oh. We so we the, we found out about this oh. one because our continuity department went there for a team building exercise. They had a great time, and so we thought, oh, it might be fun to do well, one. Well, you in. have nice people, you know. The, well, you, you got to like the team in the first place. Yeah, it really yeah. depends on the team you're playing with. I used to when I used to work for like video game companies and things like that. We would run through those stuff, those things. Like when I worked for GameSpot, they we were went good. A I one bet. hour one in thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, they were not so good. <laughs> Uh, but I think if you do, if you do, that was only the second one I've ever done. If you do them a lot, you get better at them because you kind of understand. It's like the New York Times crossword puzzle. It's hard at first, but after you do it for a while, it gets easier. Right? Yeah, there's a little bit of a language to it. There's a language to it. Yeah. There definitely is a language to yeah. it. So you've done it too, Paris? I've done, I'm trying to find the, I've got to log back into my Google search. I did an escape room about a year or two ago, a really cool high tech one. It's this company that has, um, at the time it had two. One was you were inside basically a full subway car, like, but it oh was just God. on a oh, floor fun. in the middle of Midtown. And so you had to pull all these stuff, you'd go into different rooms. The one we ended up doing, because my friends had done the subway one before, but I looked at it, was... Essentially, you were like almost on a spaceship. It was like a futuristic world, and there were all these different panels and things. There was at one point, if you uh, got to a certain point, a laser, like a robot with a laser beam came out, and you had to hide from the robot before you could get into the next room. It was awesome. Wow. Um, highly recommend a high tech escape room. Yeah, you do fun. You go to mazes and escape rooms, and you do fun things. I love, uh, love a little puzzle on interactive. Yeah, me experience. too. I like puzzles. Uh, oh. Micah Sargent just turned me on to the New York Times Connections. You know, we all do the Wordle, and I've done the crossword puzzles for a while. Have you tried the Connections yet? No, but someone on the subway the other week recommended it's I do hard. Connections. So maybe it's my yeah, time. It's fun. Well, this is the second Somebody time. on the subway? <laughs> you know, I was, my mother was in town a couple of weeks ago, and I was showing her Wordle. She got really into it, and I was telling her about the history behind Wordle, and it's is it James story. Wardell, the guy, yeah, you know? Yeah. And someone next, sitting next to her on the subway was like, oh, yeah, and kind of talking to us about it. And he was like, oh, you should try Connections. Here, I'll um, show you. This is, this is today's Connections, which I have not yet started. So they give you 16 words. In this case, well, like, um, house, hem, er, darn, follow, seem, share, erm, scrubs, uh, ratchet now obviously um uh er and maybe erm might all go together you have to figure out there's four groups where they go together you only get four would tries would erm be different maybe i don't know maybe darn instead of know. erm here let's no, let's guess i think it's see. like it's like a nope i'm one away Maybe it's like instead of oh, like the well. no, like goes with instead subscribe, of share, and uh, oh. oh yeah, see there no, you go, Sub right. subscribe, share, uh, 
follow. There you go. That's I'm going to play with Benito from now on. So he says, yes, yeah, social media wow. actions. So now we narrowed it down. There's there's four of them. One, each one's harder than the next. Um, house darn seam scrubs well. Maybe seam and hem are sewing things and darn and so and so and yes, sewing terms, right? This is great content, guys. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Use a needle and thread. Okay, so it's hard. It's, anyway, yeah, we won't keep going. But oh, well, can I know you got to finish? Huh? No, we do. We do have to finish. Okay. Well, the good news what is, is if we get the third one, the fourth one solves itself. So Ratchet and Scrubs is a nurse. Nurse Ratchet. House and herb. Well, and well, house, house, like well, like well, house. like Doctor House or whatever. Doctor you know? House, okay. Nurse yeah. Ratchet, yeah. Scrubs, yeah. and Rubs ER. Oh, ER, right. Scrubs, yeah. House. Oh, and so then it's... What's a TV yeah. show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a TV show besides... So these are all TV shows. House, Scrubs, ER. I think Ratchet's a show. Is Ratchet... Oh, yeah, Ratchet was a show. It was about Nurse Ratchet. Yeah. Bingo, bango, bungo. Wow. Shows set in hospitals. And then Well, Erm, uh, and Um, which I thought was going to be the easiest. And we've solved it. What did you do wrong in the first one? What did you? Include? Oh, I probably put darn we in there. Or we include something. no, we included er, er, er yeah, er. oh er. I hate. Puzzles. But they do that I don't on want purpose. To be dragged in. See, they do you're it on a puzzle purpose. hater. Yeah, you're. Well, I you're, like the crossword. Yeah, the crossword. So you pay to get that? No, I do pay to get this. I pay the New York Times. I just pay the New York fee. Times all in. Oh, I guess you're right. I get that as part of that. Yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is, Lisa always does the wordle. So I have to do the wordle in an incognito window. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> once it's solved, wordle. it remembers that it's solved, right? So you have to, I always Who's have to, better at wordle? Oh, you she's Lisa. really good. She's so What's good. your opening word? Uh, I like tears because it ends with an S and it's got those <laughs> E. I like tears. I like tears. Very funny. What's your opening I word? I use irate. Irate's good. It's got a lot of vowels in it and so, then R and T. As a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier, when I want to go to Wordle, what do I do? I go to this the, the menu bar and I type Wordle, right? Don't yeah, you? Yeah, because then, oh wait, and do you just search Wordle? You don't scroll down to the URL? No, well, I then, just type Wordle in here. I think Jeff and I are on the same thing. We scroll down to the URL in the search. Oh, you in see the, it here? No, yes. no, no. Well, no. well that's time. too much work. I just type it and then it's the first thing. I'm not giving any tech company an extra web page view. <laughs> you remember when Google used to just put the dot com on there for you? Yeah. Well, they do on some things. Uh, they still do. They'll put the dot com on. Um, how about a quick change log before we wrap things up for the week? The Google change log. I do not like ads on youtube it can get very intrusive so i pay for youtube premium but there are a lot of other people who say ah oh, no just use an ad blocker well google's wise to you they are now fully blocking ad blockers around the world in a statement shared with the verge youtube says it has launched a global effort to urge viewers urge them with ad blockers enabled to allow ads on youtube or try youtube premium for an ad free experience paris I think you're a cheapskate. I think you do not pay for YouTube Premium. I'm thinking. I don't watch YouTube. Oh. I don't consume visual oh. content. I don't. I don't consume video content. You like to? I know what you life. do. You curl up on a couch with Gizmo the cat and your Monstera, and you read a book made out of paper. I know you do that. Yeah, totally. That's definitely what I do. <laughs> I don't play video you don't games. You play Baldur's or Gate till four in the morning. Scroll <laughs> infinitely on my phone. I do irritate things like using a book. No, I do read. You read um, Pride I just and don't Prejudice watch. I, over and over. And yeah, I see just over and a over. Copy of the New Yorker there. Yeah, is there? Yeah, I read. I have. Um, is there? I have, yeah, I, not the New Yorker, but I have New York Magazine. I have Bloomberg uh, Business Week. There you go. I have Wired that's, Magazine. That's all for work. I mean, it's for pleasure, too. I enjoy, I love a good magazine. Jeff, you pay for YouTube Premium. I think we've talked about that, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I have to. What are you guys, what are you guys watching on, oh, I know, Leo, you I watch everything. The ads. What are you watching on YouTube, I'm not watching, I don't watch much, actually. Ah, I watch I YouTube all the time. 
You want to see? I get YouTube Premium because one time I got in, a song got interrupted in the middle with an ad. I was like, "What? You can't do this in music. You can't do this in music." It's terrible. So here's my. Why are uh, you watching a song on YouTube? Because I don't own it. What? And I don't use Spotify. Are you kidding? All the youngs do that. I'm. You're old for your age. That's yeah. how no, you get I'm, music. I'm weird because I don't use. You YouTube. are weird. I know this. Yeah. All I'm the, just interested. All the kids. That's their music. Is YouTube. Let's I see guess. what I um. What what YouTube's the most butterfly butterfly imaginable is the first thing. Oh, but coming this up is on your okay because Jeff will appreciate this. This is this is Sudoku. So oh god, he just said he boring. hates puzzles. <laughs> he has such no a no. Life. He hates me because I like puzzles. So I watch a lot of Sudoku videos. 90 Day Fiance, Season 10, Episode 5. I don't can. know why Google's recommending that. <laughs> you know you, yeah, you, you don't scroll know. Oh, I know why. Because I, I, I subscribe to Access Hollywood because my son's on that once in a while. There's Steve Gibson, oh. and but I guess these are Twit shorts. I didn't even know we did that. Look at that. Cool. We make Twit shorts. Look at that. Uh, here's uh, the last Beatles song. Just FYI, when you scroll over and the video starts playing, that counts as a view now. Oh, yeah. See, that's why views on YouTube are meaningless. So, by the way, the Now and Then story is a really neat technology story. This is the last Beatles song ever. Two take one, silent turnover. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. You can't play Yeah, we probably should do that one. Yeah, we can't do that. What's the story, Jeff? The story is that there was a, I think, a Lennon track... Guys, we them. started out trying to do the change log at the beginning of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> story. Story. Are you <laughs> just now story. realizing that we have no attention? This is how this works? <laughs> yes. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> so it's an AI story, you see. Because there's uh, not because, a good recording of it. Right. And now AI can separate out the instrumental track from the voice track. And they have other stuff together. So it was, in fact, they were working on the song. And now they can come out with the is, last this song must, they actually were working on. This is the last song ever. And this must be the Peter Jackson technology. Because it's you remember Peter Jackson. Line. You know, I got it here. Uh, Peter yeah. Jackson did uh, a great documentary, which I recommend to anybody who wants to spend 18 hours watching the Beatles sit around talking. Uh, but in order to do it, the, the, the documentary that we're making, uh, they weren't interested in what the kids were saying. They were interested in the music. So they weren't, they weren't miking. The Beatles. So Peter Jackson, the film director who did The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, had to go in and develop AI technologies that could actually improve the voice. And actually, it's amazing to hear them talking. I'm being silly. And I th I bet you it's the same technology that they're using to recover this. Yeah, this was... So Yoko had a recording of a demo. And it was a bootleg. It circulated for years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was finished in the studio last year by Sir Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. George Harrison re-recorded rhythm guitar parts in 1995. Producer Giles Martin, who is, uh, what's his name, Martin's son, the original, what's his name? Something Martin. Anyway, gosh, wow. that's a memory hole. Those who've heard the finished track say it's a poignant and moving reflection on the band's friendship. Sir Paul says he cries. George Martin. George Martin, thank you. Hearing G Rob uh, Sheffield of Rolling Stone magazine, hearing John and Paul sing the first chorus together as they lock into the line, now and then I miss you, is intensely powerful, to say the least. Well, I'm going to have to listen to that. Yeah. See, it was a good story there, Paris. It has nothing to do with Google. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't saying it wasn't going to be a good story. I just realized in that moment that we were in a segment that we did not spend a single second on. You understand now <laughs> how this show happens. Google's officially trying to make Sorry, dot. Sorry, you're trapped now in the and you can't escape the room, Paris. It's true, no, this timer's going on forever. <laughs> Google's officially trying to make dot ing domains a thing. You can now register them as part of an early access program. It's funny because Google got out of the domains business, selling it to Squarespace, but I guess they're still. You know, you have to spend a lot of money to get a new TLD, top-level domain. And Google's trying to recoup that money <laughs> because, for instance, if you try to buy th.ing, it'll cost you $40,000 a year from GoDaddy. What would you do? Per Parising? Parising would be good. Uh, sure. Jeffing? I've already got Paris.nyc, which is pretty oh, good. Oh, that's excellent. That's good. That's excellent. That's good. It combines two of my favorite cities into it. What yep. about podcast? 
Eating. Oh, podcasting. Oh, God. How do I get it? <gasps> okay, let's let's have it right now. Right now. Where would I go to get it? Go Daddy? Oh, God. Yeah, I guess that. I guess that's Google, who's got it. Google Domains. Is uh, search Domains. They've pod- cleaned up Go Daddy quite a lot. Oh, really? Dot ing. ing. Oh, if I could get this, I'd be rich. It's only $4,000 a year. <laughs> a year. Wait a minute. And that doesn't guarantee it. And that's just for, pro- that's you. yeah. Vastly for improve your odds of gaining this domain. GoDaddy submits your pre-registration when it opens on December 5th. That costs $4,000. Or for a little more, I get priority pre-registration. Jeez. And then, wait a minute. Hey, you could get podcast.sucks for two grand a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cheap. Podcast store, podcast <laughs> Inc. Just put a G at the end. Oh, podcast dot zone. There you is, go. Uh, ten, ten bucks. bucks a year. That's a bargain. Wow, these are cheap. Podcast dot Earth twenty nine ninety nine a year. Maybe I should really be uh, podcast care. Uh, remember when they somebody spent millions of dollars to get sex dot com and then they found out it's really worthless. Nobody, yeah. you know, that's the generic domain names are worthless. Because they because they go to Google and they type in sex and they're not going to get sex.com. Right. It's true. Google they're going to start buying some ads. Google has, compl- I don't know what this story <laughs> means. I think this must be a Jason Howell. It's from Search Engine Journal. Google completes switch to mobile first indexing. It's, me. it's a me. No, I put it in there. Well, well, you better explain it. Explain yourself. <laughs> well, it's been really going on for quite some time. Basically, Google is going to check mobile pages first before they do web pages. <gasps> wow. That's kind of a big so you change. You better have a good uh, mobile page. And I guess they've been doing. They've been. It's been a long transition, but it's done. That's the a work big deal. is done. The scaffolding is down. The workers have gone home. They've taken their lunch pails with them. Google Fiber, which Google is now rebranding G Fiber, which sounds as they like rebrand cereal. everything in stupid ways. <laughs> it sounds like something you should cereal. eat to be more regular. <laughs> um, if you're an old guy. For now, this is early access, but most customers will be upgraded to 20 gigabits per second. Whoa. What the yeah. hell? Yeah. No They're one has only- an Ethernet connection for that, though. No one has an Ethernet card that can go 20. No, of course not. In fact, it's a big deal if you have a 10 gigabit Ethernet card. 20, forget it. We have 10 gigabit symmetric here, and most of our machines can't. will handle one. Huh. To- so the 20 gigabit service is made possible by new networking gear from Nokia, uh, which means they could push more bandwidth over existing lines. So maybe other ISPs will do that. Maybe our Sonic connection will be 20 gigs symmetric at some point. Um, Google's head of product, Nick Saparito, says, we definitely see a need for 20 gigabit service. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he sounds like. That's exactly. His name is Saparito. He says the service. It is true. These cable guys are like that. Yeah. It's a very yeah. early adopter product, but it will eventually roll out in most, if not all, of our markets. No <laughs> word on how much it'll cost, though. I mean, I think it might cost more, right? Google Bard can now respond in real time. What, what does that mean? It's already. Should we try it? I don't Okay. Uh, so normally, I what see happens, you didn't just search Bard in Google, Leo. You entered a URL. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Oh, I yeah, typed B A R D and I let Google fill it in. Uh, so give me a question. Um, can you respond in real time? Can you respond? Now, normally, it takes uh, Chat GPT for maybe three or four seconds, right? Oh, it's to respond ICT faster. Okay. That's a couple seconds there. <laughs> yes. Come on. That is slow. It should start with saying like, um, uh, uh, and then. Yeah. <laughs> what is the capital of France? It has to think. Yeah. That's um, not real time. Uh, uh, Sorry, buddy. Mm. Sorry, buddy. How about... 
my trick as a teacher is to say, good question, to buy myself time. <laughs> yeah, and then you answer the question you wish they asked. That's, yes. that's the best way to do a media hit on TV. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good question. I hate it when people say good question. That's so patronizing. But now I realize they don't mean it. They're just stalling. No, that's why, That's literally why I do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I've never once said good question because I thought it was like I hate a good, good question. question. Whether or not it is, it's just I got to have you a couple know, minutes know, to another think. another pet peeve? And don't ever do this when you interview people, but I bet you don't because your quality is the, the uh, I call it the the hyperbole question. Like, what was your most embarrassing moment on the radio? Ugh. I hate the most, or what's your favorite, or what's the best? I hate those, you know? What was yeah. your most embarrassing moment on the radio? Shut that up. I don't know. It's a bad question. Yeah, wh what's the, one that, what's the uh, one that comes to mind or haunts you in your I, dreams? I don't want to talk about it. It's embarrassing. Why would I Have repeat you ever it? Thrown up on Mike? No. <laughs> oh, that's that that's surprising, be, honestly. That would be awful. Time. Forty. I've been in uh, broadcasting forty-seven years, and I've never thrown up on microphone. <laughs> Have you burped? Yeah, well, many times. I do that all the time. Yeah. You can't help that or hiccups, uh, sneezes, coughs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but those are not embarrassing. It's just human, and we can edit that out. But, I, you know, I worked in How live many... forever, so I'm still live. I'm, you know, I still do it live, really, I guess. Jeff and I were talking about this before the show. How many hours do you think you have been recorded or on mic in your life? Just on Total. Twit alone, I, the statistic is up in my office. Do you have access to that page that Patrick Delahanty made? Benito, do you know where that is? You may not have access to that. I don't. Is it a web page? It's in my office. Um, at, the last time I looked... You could, John's going to pull it up. But the last time I looked, uh, if you started listening to the podcast we started in 2005 and you continue to listen to all of them, it would take you more than three years to listen to everything, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are wow. many tens of thousands of hours. He's not on all of those, but many. Most, many. Uh, I mean, I, th I don't know, back of envelope, uh, been uh, doing probably five hours. Let's say I did three hours a day, five days a week, 15 hours a week for the last 47 okay, years. Okay, Patrick has it in uh, in chat and <laughs> Discord. <laughs> it adds up. <laughs> it's also missing many episodes of the Tech Guy. So 995 days, eight hours, 38 minutes, and 54 seconds <laughs> to be. Wow. But who's counting? Patrick is. <laughs> and you know what? I can do it in real time. Unlike Google Bard. Unlike Bard. Yeah. NFL Sunday ticket price on YouTube TV, 50% cut. Well, the season's half over. What's the big deal, folks? <laughs> I didn't put that one in there. Good Lord. Oh, good news. You only have to pay half as much for half the season. But it's the better part of the season. It is, actually. That's the half you want. Google Keep is now replacing two Google apps that no one ever used, Assistant Notes and Shopping List. I don't even remember these. Assistant Whose job is it to just go through the, the, the archives of Google and say, well, we still do that. Here it is. Did you ever see this? Look, I actually have a shopping list. Google Shopping List. <laughs> Broccoli. Wow. Steel Cut Oats. Lee. Leaves. I love all the ones that say food at the bottom. Rosemary, asparagus, <laughs> cream cheese, market steaks, food. Food, food, food. 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 You got to get on that, Leo. He's not picky, Leo. Just as long as you can call it food, it's going in. Really important. You can't forget that. I wish this had a date on it. I wonder when I made this list. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Buy food. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll forget. Put them on your shopping list. <laughs> You're at home. Open up your refrigerator. Food. It's empty. You're like, oh, man, I, I forgot need food. to buy food. I'm going to buy food. Got to put it on the list. Oh, crud. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man. They lift up food. And that is the Google change log. From the information, <laughs> a long article about my pen. Has Humane created the next <laughs> iPhone or the next Google Glass? This is Julia Black, your colleague. We were talking yeah. about this. November 9th, we're going to find out. 
I does this now you I presume you read the article, Paris. Yeah. Does it make you now think more of me? Um, <laughs> it makes me more aware of the amount of money you're willing to spend on a, <laughs> a fun little pin. Yeah, on stupid yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um I thought it was kind of interesting that uh she writes that Humane, which is the company behind this pin, was really shocked actually by a different report by the information that uh, Sam Altman, one of Humane's biggest shareholders, was in discussions with OpenAI to maybe make some sort of like physical device, be it a phone or a wearable. And they, they were, were going to have Johnny Ive design it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of the reason why they moved uh, the launch date back from the eclipse to November uh, 9th. And wasn't there, and Sam also invested in another AI recording device that's kind of competitive. That Is this I, the Rewind pen? Yeah, the Rewind. I wanted to buy that also. I want them all. You should just, you know, get a line in to Sam Altman and be like, anything you invest in, just give me one of those. Yeah. Um. Well, we'll see which comes out first. How about that? It did give some more uh, detail about kind of what this pin is going to be. I mean, it's about, it's a screenless device about the size of a saltine cracker equipped with a camera, a microphone, a speaker, a variety of center, sensors, and a laser projector. Uh, it is going to secure to your clothing magnetically, which we knew, but it's going to have a camera with a 180 degree field of view to kind of take in the world. And the company is going to have basically a mobile virtual virtual network that it's operating so that you don't have to have it work with a cell phone service at all. It's supposed to be kind of a hands-free smartphone replacement. See, don't you want that? Here's a picture of its designer uh, wondering where his beer went. <laughs> um, I don't know what he's he's actually well, projecting under his hand. Well, they didn't say. say they month? don't say, do they? It's a subscription. It's unclear what the monthly yeah. data subscription will be, but it's expected to cost as much as a thousand dollars before you get to for the, the device. But that, but an for iPhone device, costs yeah. twelve hundred bucks or more. And I can't. But this is stick a tiny pin that you. I mean, <laughs> you could. Have you heard of pockets? You get a little pocket, pocket right there. Pockets the clown. I think if I had the proper <laughs> magnet here. That's true. Right they do have magnets now. Yeah, yeah it yeah. would be right there. There you go. But this is smaller. It's less obtrusive, and it doesn't have a screen. That's what oh, he, by the way, what he's doing is looking at his palm because it's projecting like an incoming call on his palm. Um, I think my favorite thing about my phone is looking at the screen, though. I know people poo-poo screen time, but I love the screen. The screen brings me joy. The screen brings me pain, but it also brings me joy. Yeah. Here's Naomi Campbell. Uh, wearing it in a, a fashion show in Paris uh, last month. She says, my eyes are up here. There's the pin. It looks like an Apple Watch kind of on her lapel. Yeah. Right? Uh, Humane is currently valued at $850 million. So let's do the over-under for the... Um, did you, do you remember Humane? The story. Yeah, yeah. I have How quite long? a few of those devices. Yeah. Yeah. Be real mm -hmm. is there is kind of that. It's yeah. kind of the next be yeah. real. Yeah. But this People is People are still hardware. using be real a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, That's free. Way down. Way down. Yeah, way, down. way down. No, not in any way. It's not doing well. I'll give it about yeah. 10 quibbies. 10. <laughs> it's yeah. 10 quibbies. It's very good. Quibby very good. 10 quibbies, quibbies is generous. Yeah. Ten, quibby, quibby lasted six months. Till yeah, like six months. Was it six months? No, it was like two months, wasn't it? Because um, it launched right as the pandemic started. Out. And then it, is it longer actually than decided to fold. Oh, yeah. Scaramucci is like uh, a fraction of a Quibi. Let me ask Bard. How long is a Quibi? <laughs> okay. If Bard can give me the correct answer to this, I will. I'll rethink some of my. A Quibi is a 10 minute episode of video. Well, is that the problem? No. It See, okay, AI but here, never take it did over. give me some oh. information. It launched Whoa. in April and shut down in October. So that is oh. uh, six months. Hmm? Let's see. Should I ask Chat GPT? <laughs> uh, chat. I just type chat and it opens. It's amazing. Oh, I got to log in. Uh, never mind. It's going to take a while. I should have a shorter password. Yeah, I think. 
I don't know, 18 months. I'd say 18 months is me being generous. Really? Interesting. Uh, you know, remember the nothing phone? That went away quick. It's it's phone I, priced, you know, which is problematic. But they have a lot of they probably have a lot of runway. I don't know. Let's see. Let's do chat GPT four. Mm -hmm. And I could get an image of how long a quibby is, but I won't do that. How long is a quibby? A quibby is the term. Oh, see, they coined the quibby as the term. Five to ten minutes in length, according to chat. GPT. Right there is the inf information of how yeah, long. Yeah, April to December. Yeah. See, this is somewhat useful. The problem I find is it's it's wordy. Uh, yes. Yes. And I, I think that's a pro I don't know. I think it's a problem. It's not as well, it's because it doesn't know actually what you're asking. Right. It's it has to trying to guess and it's trying to answer it the best it can by throwing as much as it can at you. I mean, I think in both of those cases, the real thing we were looking for wasn't the first or second sentence. Or right. you know what it makes me think of? It's like an eighth grader trying to do an essay question. Yes. yes, and I think this probably is what many eighth wants. graders yes. are yeah. using this to do an essay question. Yes. So it's kind that of too. a snake eating a snake. That's exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything? Uh, we're we're out of time. I'm going to do the last break, but I'll give you Jeff and uh, Paris uh, an opportunity. If there's a story in here that we missed, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, you added quite a few stories, but I think we got to a lot of those. Yeah, yeah you got to a lot of yeah. stuff. Um, oh, I know, I know. This one. This is really, really minor. It'll drive you crazy. It drives me crazy, at least. So Jason Calacanis <laughs> goes on to Twitter. He's looking for a CEO to run all in, which is currently the pod and the summit. And he's looking for somebody with luxury brand experience. Podcasts as luxury brands. He says he doesn't want any media executives. He wants hospitality executives or luxury. He wants Angela Arendt's. He doesn't want, you know, He's just so less movies. Yeah. Who are the hosts uh, of All In? Uh, I have no idea. Oh, yeah, I do. It's David Sachs. Uh, Chamath. Chamath. Uh, I listened to it Fried once. David and they Friedberg. Were, and they were boasting about how much money they had spent. Chamath. Uh, yeah, Chamath. Palahaptia who is, uh, these are all VCs, uh, David Sachs and David Freeberg, cover all things echo something, <laughs> economic, echo, <laughs> here, I don't know, economic, technical, political, social, and poker. But I tuned in once, and by the way, Jason used to be a regular on, on our shows. So he stole your concept. A good yeah. long time. Well, and then he, I even made it up with him after that. Because um, you're a nice guy. But... Uh, I feel like it's a bunch of rich guys bemoaning, you know, poor people. <laughs> and then I think the last <laughs> I thing I heard that, was yeah. he saying, well, if you're going to go to Tokyo, you've absolutely got to go with Mark Zuckerberg. He knows all the places. And it was like. <laughs> 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 so I don't know. But you know, I guess they're doing well. They got 42 million views. Uh, they got half. A I mean, it's an incredibly popular podcast in the tech VC. But so is Joe really Rogan, is. right? I don't. Yeah, understand no, I'm not Joe saying Rogan's that means success. it's good. Really <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the bros. Bros listen to a lot of podcasts. I get. I guess. Uh, Joe Rogan's boss is, is uh, popular because it's it's the place where kids can go because they don't have like that older cousin anymore that tells them weird stories. <laughs> That's who Joe Rogan is now. Yeah, my son listens to it. I got in the car with him the other day. He was listening to Joe Rogan. No. He says, don't judge me. No. Yeah. No. You have to stage an intervention, Leo. Yeah. Uh, he's going to he's gonna take the red pill. No, I don't think he's going to get red pilled. I've, I've trained him well. Big article in the Hot Pot Ariel Shapiro's uh, newsletter about podcasting about Joe's big decision. I mentioned this earlier. It's been three years. Will he renew? Will well, it may not be up to him. Do you think Spotify will turn their back on Joe Rogan? I know they're tightening their belts, but yeah, he, bra so. you know, as as Ariel points out, he brings the ad fees way up on Spotify. It's a million dollars to buy an ad on his show. Jesus. One million dollars. But is that going to Spotify? It's going to Joe Rogan, right? No. Well, they're, they're, they're splitting it somehow. Oh. But they gave him a lot well, of I mean, money I suppose we'll see whether or not 
the deal has been lucrative based on the fact that if he, they renew it or not. Didn't he recently announce that he was going to release the first two hours of his podcast on Twitter? Well, that's the thing. I imagine there are people coming to him saying, uh, I can, I will, whatever Spotify's paying you, I will double it because he's, he's the number one podcast in the world. He's worth it, I guess. Um, Sirius could buy him, you know. Sirius, Premier, uh, Twitter. There are a lot of people coming to him, probably offering him a lot of money. Be interesting to watch. We will see. Yeah, Elon would love to own him. I think if you're Joe and you want if it depends what Joe's priorities are. As as uh, Shapiro points out, he may just want to come in, turn on the microphone, talk, and leave. But if he wants to build a business, he could absolutely build a, a billion-dollar business on his own. He doesn't need them. Well, it's it's what Howard did with Sirius. <laughs> But the difference is that right now Joe is exclusive to Spotify and Howard's exclusive to Sirius. You want to build a really big business, don't be exclusive. That's what I said to him. Right, right, I agree. Yeah. You could be so much bigger by just saying anyone who wants to listen can listen. I mean, if you're getting a million dollars a minute for ads on Spotify, which is only 17% of the podcast market, then I imagine you could get more if you were everywhere. Yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Would YouTube wants to get in podcasts? How much money can Google throw on the table? More than Spotify. God, I hope they don't do Joe Rogan. though. that'd be the worst thing. For well, I think that's the I only thing what... that's stopping that is that Joe's got kind of a reputation, right? Uh, yeah. I wonder you... if going to Spotify exclusive impacted his listenership in any major way. I feel like it possibly didn't. He had to pull all his YouTube videos down, but I guess the the kids like my my son who want to hear Joe. Just get the Spotify app. You don't have to pay for it, right? You just have to have an account and they get the Spotify yeah. app and listen. Do you listen to uh, Joe Rogan, Benito? I do not, know. Why not? Thank goodness. Benito's a smart man. Oh, that's why. I have a... Uh, because I already listen to podcasts like four hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's podcasts are, are the only podcasts longer than our own. Which is saying something because we're at the yeah. two and a half That's, hour mark. Yeah. Let me take a break and then we will get your picks of the week. I have a weird one. I'm very curious what you think about uh, mm -hmm. my my pick of the week. But first, a word from Collide, K O L I D E, a device trust solution for companies that use Okta. See, Okta makes sure that the right person gets in. Collide ensures that if the person's device isn't trusted and secure, they can't log into your cloud apps. If you work in a security or IT and your company's using Okta, this is for you. This is a feature you need. If you've noticed, for the past few years, the majority of data breaches, the majority of hacks you read about, they all have one thing in common, the employees. Sometimes an employee's device gets hacked, maybe because of unpatched software. That's what happened to LastPass. Sometimes an employee leaves sensitive data in an insecure or unsecured place, you see that happening all the time with the breaches on, on data and Amazon buckets and things where the secrets are actually posted on GitHub. Sometimes it seems like every day a hacker breaks in using credentials they fish from an employee. The problem here, though, I don't want to blame your employees, your end users. The problem is the solutions you're using to prevent those breaches. They're not enough, but it doesn't have to be that way. Imagine a world where only secure devices can access your cloud apps. In this world, fish credentials, useless to hackers because, you know, they just can't get through. You can manage every OS, including Linux, all from a single dashboard. That's one thing Collide does so well. Best of all, you get employees to fix their own device security issues so you don't create more work for the IT team and the employees become part of the security team. They buy into all of the security that you need them to buy into. The good news is you don't have to imagine this world. You just start using Collide. For companies with Okta, Collide is it. Collide.com slash twig. Take a look at their on-demand demo. You can book it today. See how it works for you. K-O-L-I-D-E. Collide.com slash twig. Let's get credit for twig. Collide.com slash twig. It's device trust for Okta. We thank them so much for supporting our show. So yeah, I see it all over. What? What is Okta? Uh, so Okta is a uh, authentication tool. You can put it on your phone. I used to see Premiere oh, uses it, so okay. I used to use it to log in to Premiere. If you, it, where it's it's it could be two factor, it could be passwordless, it could, you know pass keys, it could be single sign on. But the idea is it's an authentication tool. Okay, thank you. 
I just see it all over. And I didn't know yeah, that. and the, and it's a lot I of companies it up, use it. But I asked it's you. Uh, there are other solutions. Duo is another one that does this. But uh, the reason it's an interesting business for Collide because they're riding on top of Okta because Okta only authenticates the human. Collide also checks to make sure the human's device is insecure. Oh. So if my phone is hacked, Okta would let me in, but then my that would be letting in whatever's on my phone. So Collide goes the extra step. It's actually oh, a very good thank idea. Thank you. Yeah. That's interesting. Yep. Um, dot, dot AI. Have you heard of it? Yes, I have. I'm uh, no, not dot dot AI. <laughs> oh, it's the dot. It's a not. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna have to find the link. It's not what I thought it would be. Dot dot AI would be the smart <laughs> link. It is an. It's it's not out yet, but it's an AI tool that. It's by new dot computer. I'm sorry, new dot computer. Dot by new computer is they want it to be an opera an AI based operating system. I th this is what's interesting to me. We haven't seen any changes in the way operating systems operate since the very beginning. I mean, essentially, what Bell Labs came up with with Unix, or even before that, VMware uh, from on Vaxes. It's all basically the same thing. It does file handling? It opens an application. Is there a way AI could be used to change the way an operating system works and to rethink what it, what a computer is doing for you? So I don't know if this is going to take off. I got on it's only waitlist right now. We'll see. I will play with it. But they have on the website new dot computer. They have a description of how it might work for you. So the idea is it's initially it's not an operating system standalone. It's running as an app on your phone. They use as an example uh, a young woman named May. She's a first semester college student. Last day before school begins, she's in kitchen at home. Her grandmother hands her a recipe. Take it. That way home will never feel too far away. Nice. Thank you, Grandma. Oops, it's in Chinese. Grandma's flatbread is May's favorite. She shares it with Dot. She takes a picture. And Dot is on a is basically a messaging app. This is my grandma's flatbread. It translates it, creates a recipe, and then she has a button. She could press it to add it to her data bank before leaving for school the next day dot may sends dot her class syllabi for the semester when it's time to buy the textbooks she says uh hey i'm at the bookstore what textbooks do i need to buy dot says here's a shopping list based on the syllabi you sent me all of these capabilities by the way all ai has today in various ways right you could combine them together may heads to the library to prepare for the first test of the semester Dot helps quiz May on her class notes. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting. Here's all my she, notes. She says, she quiz just me. texted, I need help studying for my midterm. She's been storing her notes in there, right? Yep. Um, by the way, Dot this knows. This is kind of notebook hell Kind yeah. of. Yeah. And I would yeah. love to see this as an operating system, like going the next step. In fact, that's what the pin could be, right? That's the agent blob. The agent blob. Yeah. Um, I think that like a lot of the interesting ideas in general, like in this wave of AI are kind of circling around this idea. Yes. That you kind of can use AI to improve your memory, to be the connective tissue between a lot of different disparate pieces of information you collect in your day-to-day -day life. And then imagine giving it a voice that you no longer have to have a screen or a phone. Or maybe you have a pen and you can say, hey, Dot, here's my... Take a picture of this. This is my grandma's recipe. Dot says to you, I got it. You can then later say, hey, I need that recipe. And maybe Dot prints it out somewhere or projects it somewhere. I love this idea. It's almost her, right? It's almost that that AI yeah. agent. Anyway, I thought this was I interesting. Can get I can get behind this. And this is exactly what I thought you meant when you said Dot AI. Yeah. Because it's not Dot Dot AI. Yeah. No, this is exactly what I thought you meant was yeah. new dot computer right. because I I do not go this I do not go to clubs normally. That's not my scene. I was at a club in Williamsburg a month ago and met the co founders of no. the app, oh. Sam and Jason. Yeah. <laughs> and oh so I've God. been following along with them launching it. They seem very nice. Jason Yuan. Who is uh, Jason has very cool blonde hair. Yeah, yeah look at him. There he's he is. ex Apple design team. He created another OS, Mercury OS. Uh, he's the co-founder, along with S.J. Whitmore, Sam Whitmore. Sam Whitmore. She's not a cat. 
Sam is not a cat. But you met Sam and you met them both and Jason? Met, met them both. Wow. They were really nice. They were in New York for the weekend. Um, yeah. I, I think I mean, they've raised money, right? Yeah, they have. Um, I'm not sure how much, but they have. Uh, there are some people using it. Uh, Mark Wilson at Fast Company uh, has been using it. He's for two months. So I, I immediately put it on the waiting list. Uh, no, but I should have said, oh, I know iPhones. Paris Martineau. I list, clearly missed. Okay, I'll try it out. And uh, yeah, I'll see, I'll see what we could do. Talk to him. See if you can get in on it. Yeah, I'll see, if we can, I saw, I'll see if we can get a little test going on here. On Whitmore Twitter. was a former head of engineering at Ken Show which is uh, an AI innovation arm of the S&P Global. So, I mean, these people have credentials. And, and apparently... They also, from they're... the brief conversation I had with them at a club about AI, they seemed like they had their, you know, head screwed on right. Yeah. They didn't seem like they were lost in the sauce. They're currently using Anthropic and ChatGPT, and I think even Bard. They're using a variety of uh, tools. Um. But they hope at some point to put it, make it an on-device thing, and I think we're getting close to that, uh, yeah. both with Google and Apple. That the power, but the storage can, piece is interesting too. Is that you're you're giving it your notes all term, and it's and it's it's compiling that, and remembering that, and doing something with it. That's what's interesting. That's to me the most interesting use of AI right now is giving it a, a corpus and then asking it questions about the corpus, so, which, which is, is what Notebook LM does. Notebook LM, yeah. It to me that's that's trouble free because it's not gonna it can't make up stuff but it can help you and i remember oh, yeah. i told you this the anecdote about sitting with friends and he it recorded a conversation and it synopsized it and gave right. us action items that was really cool that's what that's why this humane pin is intriguing to me the idea of selectively recording stuff even just having this show and then say what are the show notes i've seen ai generate show notes from our transcriptions of our shows and they're quite good so i feel yeah, like I, there's I, something there I, I ordered that other one and then realized it wasn't going to work on my phone. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm crushed. J, my friend Jay Rosen, NYU, and I had a conversation about the Gutenberg parenthesis at my school, and they didn't record it. And I was thinking, you know, if I had just recorded my phone, if I had just had it, yep. you know, there's moments where Jay said really smart things, and I want to remember them, and I can't. Yep. To, mm -hmm. to yeah, to just everything should be recorded. For, reflex. There's nowadays. There's no, as Unless long as you get permission. Criminal. There's no reason yeah. not to keep track of everything. You have plenty of storage. The problem, of course, there were twofold. One is storing it. Okay, we got plenty of storage. The second one was, what do I do with it once I've got it? And if you've got an agent that can go through it and give you actionable items, wow. Can you imagine what lawyers at places like Google are doing now? No, you do yeah. not bring that to work. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Every meeting is suddenly recorded oh, yeah. an yeah. audio no, no, video. No, 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 no. So that's hysterical. Uh, so you were hanging out with the founders. Cause, Next cause, time cause you Paris go to the club, cool. the clubbing with the dot. It's so funny that you said that. I was like, oh, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I just saw they launched. New dot computer. That's uh, the New website. New dot computer. Yep. Paris, your pick of the week. My pick of the week is this lovely little flip clock. Um, you know, sometimes oh, I love you want to tell the time. It's a clock with flaps, uh, and it makes a really fun noise every time the minutes change, and it makes an even more fun noise when the hours change. And I can kind of hear it just faintly across my apartment, and I'm like, oh, that's the hour noise. Oh. It's 9 p.m. It's oh. lovely. Is I've it got really old? My desk. Like, do they still no. make it? Yeah, so I included the link uh, to where I got it from oh. this uh, in the show notes. They have a bunch of different ones. I really like the design of it as well. It's based on, it's Twemco, which is an old or clock making uh, company. And yeah, they have a lot of different fun colors. Um, yeah, the link is here. I'll put it in the chat too. Very nice. Let me, let me pull it up so I can show you. What I've been thinking about uh, is a giant, you know how in railroad stations they'd have those giant flat boards? Yeah. There's yeah. some companies that make those. Oh, I think those are so cool. I really cool. want one of those in the house. <laughs> or maybe on this in the studio. I don't well, know. The studio. The studio. Or Who's even the guest, so the guest in, today? Um, that would yeah. be so cool. 
and you could kind of program it. The ones I like on these is uh, the one on the right there, the calendar flip wall clock that has Ooh. not only the time, but the day and the oh, date. Oh, it's a little pricey. It's just so fun. 400 I mean, shrinkers. yeah. Oh, it's big. Yeah, they're That's a bit why. pricey. They're large. Oh, and I they actually flip. I mean, so all of them, it's like little cards that flip. It's yeah. so cute. It's like how it used to be at the airport, like a yeah. little board. That's why I want yes. that big enunciator. Yeah. This is crafted by one by one of the only remaining flip clock manufacturers, first founded in 1968. So there, wow! I want this. This is a the retrospect sells all sorts of retro stuff. Yeah, highly recommended. I've got one on my desk at the office, uh, and people always ask me about yeah. it. Yeah, have you seen the annual clock? No. A friend of mine named Jennifer Brendel, who spoke to our, our executive program today, showed her clock. She has a collection of clocks. And it's at uh, thisiscolossal.com. Uh, I think you can find it there. Yeah, I, I found it. Yep. Is this the clock that keeps time for the world? Or is no, that no, year? not the long now. Oh. This is the this is a season clock. <laughs> so wow. it must move really slow. Yeah. Time is a story we've been telling each other. Whatever, whatever. Do that, do that in the voice of the of the. Uh, of in a world where time is a story <laughs> we keep telling each other, I stop. This listening. clock will move very, very, very slowly. Slowly. Uh, uh, the colossal clock. Where is is it? Vesta that makes the uh, flap board, the Vesta board. I think they approached us. Uh, to do advertising. Yes, this is it. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a an airport oh, enunciator. I love it. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Oh. I wanted to do ads for them. I don't know whatever. Oh, can you, I buy one for myself? Yes, you can. They sell. I'm sure they're hideously expensive. Let's shop. Let's shop for a Vesta board. Oh, they're only oh. three thousand two hundred ninety-five dollars. Oh. Oh, or you could rent it for two hundred dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> um, you can do colored ones. Uh, I really wanted one of these in the uh, studio. I think that maybe wow. that's maybe why they. I, I tried to get them to say. Well, I said we'll do the ads. Just you got to get us one. Just got to get us one. That's all. Well, now you got a free God. ad. How about that? How this about is so that? So mesmerizing. You schmuck. I love flaps. <laughs> I love and the, the sound. Flip, There's a flaps. sound. It, yeah. It's great. Yeah, Do they have exactly that like at that. Grand Thank Central you. or? Uh, yeah. Uh, they used to. Oh, look up the TWA Hotel, <gasps> which is um, yes. a hotel that they've redone at JFK Airport. Which, hot tip, any New York area listeners, <sighs> Jeff, for instance, if you want to go to a fun rooftop. A yeah, pool bar. on oh, the pool. TWA oh. Hotel. They've got one. Da, 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 da. <laughs> now the the two lights going back and forth. That's more European. That wasn't U.S. Yeah, this is European. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, what? You know, this is. Isn't that weird that they worked so hard to get us digital boards, and we still want this? Yeah. So where's the TWA hotel? It's, it, at, it's connected the old TWA, to JFK. Um, it's JFK. in the old terminal. It is the old terminal. <sighs> They've lovingly recreated it just like... There's the a 60s. twister they room. Have a, they have a flip <laughs> clock. <laughs> oh, I'm staying there the next There's time I'm, going, I'm in New right, York. Oh, there it is. And... There's the flip flipboard. Wow. It's got they, a really great rooftop pool, too. And it's got the Paris Cafe. You get to watch Cafe. the planes take off. They named the restaurant for you. Yeah, that was oh very kind of him. Well, that's so Jetsons. It's oh. Wow. Hipsters are going to love this. Oh, oh, it's been open for a while. They do love it, yeah. Yeah. By Jean-Georges. Jean-Georges. The Paris Cafe. Look at That's the old it's TWA terminal. I've flown design. into that Amazing terminal building. back in the day. Holy cow. They have a wait, no, if you go back the photo of Did a you woman see that pool? The plane. The pool. Oh yeah. I was I was sitting up there a month or two ago. If you go back one more, that plane is a cocktail bar. Ah. That person is going in and out of the cocktail bar. It's not an actual plane. O M G. That's brilliant. Whoever did that must have spent a lot of money, but and it was oh, kind yeah. of a flyer, so to speak. But uh they paid off. 
Yeah, I definitely. So now the problem is you're at the air, you're at JFK, you're out on Long Island, you're not in town. Well, what if you get the flight, a friend of mine just last week, uh, we went to a benefit and he had a six o'clock flight the next morning out of JFK. Then it makes go. sense. Yeah. Here's yeah, the, uh, here's that uh, cocktail lounge in the airplane. Look at that. Really cool. I, I'm very happy SFO now has a hotel hotel yeah they got part high of yeah i've stayed there yeah it's it's great when you know there's every airport should have a hotel i think that originally was in europe right there, there, there was always a yeah. train hotel yeah. for the train station right. jeff a number of the week so you're gonna throw out a throw away all those clocks you're buying because they are now mm -hmm. i want that uh, absolutely um out, outmoded because technology has extended the day so the average day, according to Michael Wolf's Activate, uh, uh, is 32 hours long. What? Because that means more flips. Exactly. What? Because we multitask. So if you go to that spread, that that um, PowerPoint there, that line, whatever, um, number six explains that we sleep for 6.38 hours a um, page six a night. We work. For 5.2 hours a day, which is not going to make bosses we happy. We podcast for two hours and 48 minutes a day. Exactly. So if you go to the next slide, it's it's all about multitasking. That's how the, the day is longer because we... Oh, because we're doing these simultaneously. Exactly. Ah. So 71% of people do something else while listening to music. How many of you listening to the show are doing something else right now? Exactly. 59% of you are doing that right now. Wait a minute. 38% are sleeping? While they're listening to music? I don't know. Well, listen to us. <laughs> they, said they fell asleep about an hour ago, it looks like. <laughs> hey, it still we counts as, an, as a... I can't multitask while reading. I cannot. That's not... Oh, I, I cannot. can't do that. But I can definitely... I often listen to audiobooks when I'm playing a video game because I feel guilty. So I, oh my God, I can't do that. That's hard. Well, you're playing hard games. I just play slash and burn games. Like the yeah, I don't play slash games. Baldur's Gate, you got to pay attention to. You turn off the stupid game sounds? No, I like it. They're mixed together nicely. Oh, man. Oh, I hate those sounds. I hate them. <laughs> what game? Hate are you still playing Baldur's Gate 3, uh, Paris, or what are you playing these days? I'm still, I need to, I need to stop. I'm on, I'm deep in my second run i've spent too wow. many hours i gotta would you recommend branch that out. as the best game right now i think it's the it's the best game i've ever played in my life wow it's all right i gotta play it an incredible Benito, work Benito, of writing you're still it's playing an baldur's incredible gate, right, gameplay. i actually didn't get as into it as oh. most people did i mean i loved baldur's gate one and two though yeah you're still playing dwarf fortress that's what you're doing now, right now i'm playing cities and skylines too oh that looks good oh that's a that's like a sim. That. You're building a sim. Yeah, yeah, city yeah. builder. Yeah. I need a new game. I uh, try Baldur's Gate. I'm gonna. I well, you know what? It runs on a Mac, uh, and I just I just bought the new high end, high power GPU Mac. So maybe that's what I'll do. I'll give live it a stream shot. your first hour in Baldur's Gate. <laughs> you well, I finally you got can get out on of, Twitch. I finally okay. <laughs> I got out of the alien spaceship. Okay, so I'm now in the ground, and I can't figure out how to get out of that area. Like, there's no, like, I know there's a... Wait. No, just keep walking Baldur's around, Gate? Leo. Just keep walking yeah. around, Leo. So, you know, you're in the... Just keep walking around. ...mothership. I keep walking mm -hmm. around, and I keep coming back to the same place. I'm lost. I got my friend, my buddy, uh, that... I got two people. I, I got uh, got the one person who came, and then I got a person I rescued, so I got a little party going already. Uh... Yeah, you just got to keep walking yeah. around. I think you're just missing. You just got to keep walking around. There's quite a, also quite a few other people to find in that area. And yeah, you're going to be fine. This is why also, you don't want to watch me stream the, it. My one just... recommendation for act one, take a lot of rests. You think you oh. can't sleep, but there's like cutscenes that play. And it's good to rest. Rest at camp. Not really it is rest, good. but rest as no, the character. No, don't stop playing the video game. Never but stop. make camp. Yeah. As oh, your video game character okay. so that you can see a fun little cutscene with all, all of your right. friends. Well, I was playing it on uh, Windows, and I thought, I'm going to wait till the Mac version's out. I think the Mac version's out and stable and everything, right? So I think maybe that's that's what I'll be doing tomorrow. I'm curious about the performance. No, wait, wait till you get your M3. I want to I want to. Ah, the new M3. one. Yeah. I'll bring it in Tuesday. I'm getting the M3 Max. Ooh. 
with a 40 GPU processors, all of that stuff, 64 gigs of RAM. So it should be not, but it's only a 14 inch screen, but we'll hook it up to a big screen. How about that? God, that? 64 gigs of RAM is my dream. <laughs> It's Think better of than all the, the AI Chrome dream. tabs. Yeah. Like five. Yeah. All Probably, the Chrome tabs. and that would be beautiful. <laughs> five tabs at once. Wow. Thank you, Jeff. So your number is 31 hours a day. That's how many days, how many hours That's a day. If you do less than no that, that, you're slacking. No wonder we're exhausted all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've been I've been tweeting while we're on on the show, so I've been you know oh. podcasting and, and doing social media. Yeah, you're multitasking. You got to get your hours in. Yeah, yeah. I've been watching a movie during the show. So. No, I I've been doing I a second podcast. Actually, oh, I got to make sure my two, answers two work two for both of them. Two shows at the same time. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. get them both done. Mm. Paris Martineau writes for the information. She's a wizard. She's wonderful. We're thrilled to have her as part of the show now. Yes, and so is the entire audience. The, the, we have nothing, nothing but, but positive comments everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. Aww, I'm actually a sorcerer in Baldur's Gate and D and D, but a wizard I'll take. <laughs> what did I? Uh, what did I character? I can't remember what character. I think it was uh, a necromancer or a sorcerer. I like casting spells from a distance. To be honest, casting spells is nice. Yeah. you get to like do a big fireball. I don't want, I don't want to get good. in a melee situation. I just. Other people can hack and Let slash. Hack it's and not slash. for... I'm going to throw stuff. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> throw a quick spell. Uh, if you want to signal her, 267-797-8655. Only with the best tips if you work for a big tech company. Give her some Tell tips. Tell me what your companies are doing. Yeah. What are you working on right now? A big story? Any, anything that we want to um, pay attention to? I am working on a story in the health tech world. And actually, if you were a person out there who work has insight into how medical billing works. Um, <gasps> oh, what a mess As it that relates, is. you know, Eesh. it's it's a real mess. It's a nightmare. And I'm trying to comprehend it with my puny little human brain. And it's difficult. The rule is <laughs> never pay the first bill. Never yes, pay the but first yet bill. all of these startups exist to try and solve it, and they're all it's having varying degrees of success. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a real mess. Yeah. Theinformation.com. If you're not a subscriber, you're missing out on the best tech uh, reportage out there. They've got so many good people. And in fact, I just uh, subscribed to all your newsletters. <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm using this really nice tool called Omnivore. That is a newsletter for newsletters. So everything goes into the omnivore. See, I literally am subscribing oh. to all your newsletters. Wow. Uh huh. That's, yeah. Yeah. We send one out every time we do an article. Yeah. Now, too. And then uh, Big Technology, Alex Kantrowitz, uh, and some uh, Substacks. But it all goes into this reader, which is really nice. That's so fun. Do you and like this? It, yeah. Omnivore. It's open source, it's free. Uh, and uh, it does a pretty good, well, it didn't do that one. It's not rendering that one right. I clicked it, but it didn't, maybe it didn't hear. How about this? Yeah, there you go. You can see it renders it pretty much like you're reading it on the information. It does a good job. And oh, it has, beautiful. I have a custom uh, email address. Plus it does tagging. So all of your co colleagues' newsletters are here. There's Nick. Yeah. Yep. It's just he's, uh, he recently did a briefing. So that makes sense. He's good. Yeah. It's my uh, editor. That's, that's why I subscribed to them all. Thank you, Paris. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Watch out for that monstera. It's creeping up behind you, I think. It's going to take over one of these days, <laughs> getting ever that closer. Or the cat. One or the other. You're doomed. <laughs> She's trying her best. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis. He is. Let me read it to you once more. The director of the Tanite Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark. Craig Newmark. Graduate Newmark. School of Journalism at the City University of New York. And Ponderosa Kitchen Manager. I was indeed. Yes. I did tell you how I made true chef salad, right? <laughs> I don't want to know. Gutenberg parenthesis you that. is his latest book. Either. But tomorrow, the magazine book comes out. Where can we get that? Yes, it does. Go to gutenbergparenthesis.com and you can get a 20% discount on this little book, which is not expensive anyway. Object Lessons Magazine. Take a closer look at their There's aesthetic influence right and voice. <gasps> I'm going to uh, buy it right now. Yeah, I can't wait to. I love magazines. Jeff, people probably know this, uh, was the founder of uh, Entertainment Weekly, 
worked at People, worked at uh, Condi, worked everywhere, uh, and knows about TV the guide. magazine business. TV guide. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this this is the story of the magazine, which is a shame because I thought magazines were great. I, it's a it's a yeah, pretty I much a going a going medium, a done done medium. Although the other day I was at a, a Barnes and Noble in Santa Rosa, and the magazine rack goes on for miles. Well, they have, I asked the clerk uh, the, the numbers in here. The, the, they said they have twenty two hundred titles. More at Christmas with more cookie magazines, but a, and a lot of them are published once a year or once every quarter yes, or yes, once yes. only. Period or death tribute thing, yeah. and all that. So people and must so in the, be in buying the book. Them. I get to tell the story of EW's launch, but also it's the history of magazines and what they meant for society, which was a lot of fun. I'm to sad. Do. I still, uh, you know, I get the New York. I get a lot of magazines, but I don't get the paper versions anymore. I just get the. I don't anymore. At all. I used you to buy them by the pound. Versions? Do I have the most paper magazines delivered? Tell us yes. what my magazines of this you panel? get. What magazines do you get? I get Wired magazine. Yep. I get New York magazine. Yep. I get a uh, Bloomberg Business Week. Yep. Wow. I my get three none. magazines. I subscribe none. to those and the New Yorker and the New York Times and all digital. No Wall Street Journal. I all love digital. a physical magazine. The Economist. They used to have to. Uh, it piles up like guilt. They used to have to double bag me at Hudson. Yeah. The newsstand. Um, yeah. You know, I looked just the other day. I took a picture of it. There is a, a, a New York City newsstand, which was horribly designed because you could barely, you can't see the headlines or anything. There's one right by the New York Times with no newspapers and no magazines. None. <laughs> not None. That's sad. Anymore. I will say the day after uh, Biden won the most recent election, uh, or no, it was the day after the coup happened or the coup attempt, I walked all over Brooklyn for like, Hours, genuinely three or four hours, trying to find a place that would sell me a paper newspaper. Yeah. Could not find it. I went to four different places labeled oh newsstand. God. Could not yeah. get one. Did you yeah. want like just the front page to frame or keep as a history? Of yeah, it was like, you know, it's yeah, like it's a, a story. momentous moment. Let's yeah. get what did one. you do during the revolution, mom? You know, it's. Uh, I searched I, for, I wandered. for newspapers <laughs> everywhere. I went, I went to, to a place called the newsstand, and it, I was like, Do you have the newspaper? And they were like, No. Are you kidding me? You can't go no. on New York City streets and buy a, news, a paper no. newspaper anymore? The only place Not is the train Brooklyn. station or the bus station in Manhattan. Otherwise, you just can't find them. Oh, my God. They used to be on every corner. There used to be an out of, out of town newsstand. And then there were the fashion newsstands that had all the all the European magazines. That makes they are me all sad. Gone. I blame the AI. Gutenbergparenthesis.com. The new book is out. Magazine, twenty percent off at checkout Tomorrow. if you go there. Thank you. Gutenbergparenthesis.com. I don't want to end the show because I love hanging out with you guys. Uh, but I guess we have to. Paris Martineau, Jeff Jarvis, thank you. Real pleasure hanging out. Ant will be back next week. I hope you will Yay. come back to hang out with us. We do the show on Wednesdays, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the United States goes to daylight, no, goes to standard time Sunday. So yeah, we, we have we have a class that I teach every Wednesday for our executive program. Half the students are from Europe. They all came in an hour late. Yeah, because Europe's switched gone to some, has left summertime. Yeah. Just, anyway, we will finally leave summertime on Sunday. Uh, that means uh, that while our time, from our point of view, is still 2 p.m., it is now 2200 UTC. So uh, start next week, 2200 UTC. And I only say that because you can watch us live if you want to. You certainly don't have to. It's a podcast. You can watch it at your leisure at any time. But if you want to watch live, uh, the stream is at twit.tv slash live. Watching live, then chat with us in our Discord. I love having the live interaction with our fans. It's so so much fun. Uh, of course, you have to be a Club Twit member. Don't forget, twit.tv slash Club Twit. After the fact, on-demand, ad-supported versions of the show available for free at our website, twit.tv slash twig. There's also a This Week in Google channel on YouTube. Best thing to do is subscribe in your favorite podcast player. That way you'll get it automatically. As soon as we're done editing it, taking out all the cuss words and the nudity. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time on This Week in You're Google. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs seven bucks a month. 
or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.